Good evening. I now call to order the Board of Education of Baltimore County meeting for Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance with me to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence to remember those who have served education in Baltimore County. And we will also have uh, take a moment to honor our veterans as we approach Veterans Day. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with the uh, current situation with the pandemic, Baltimore County public schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our staff and our students. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner, which would allow some board members to participate remotely. <clears throat> this is subject to the mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on our website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding the motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair, I think uh, Vice Chair Hen has an addition. Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Because a request for change order approval was added to the building and contracts agenda earlier this afternoon, I move that item N8, modification for Carney, Callahan, Bressler, Bennett, and Share, be added to tonight's agenda. Is there a second? Second. And is that Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. In accordance with board policy 8314, there needs to be a majority vote of the board to add or remove an item from the agenda. Is there any discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, may I speak to my motion? Yes. Yes, the board's approval is needed to increase spending authority on the current purchasing order. That authority was approved in building and contracts earlier this afternoon. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hedges? Ms. Uh, Causey, I had my hand up. I apologize. That is Ms. Joes. Yes. Is it possible to separate the item in eight? Is it that Ms. Hen just added from the rest of procurement for um, brief discussion since we have not seen the spending authority? Ms. Hen, can you, when you, uh, when you discuss the building and contracts committee agenda items, can you uh, discuss N8 separately? Uh, thank you, you Ms. Hen. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other hands, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hecker? Yes. Yes. Ms. Sester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. 
Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. The motion carries and the item is added to the agenda. The next item on the agenda is minutes of closed session. Earlier I'm sorry, Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Scott. I had my hand raised. Okay. This, I thank apologize. you. It's not showing it. It's clearly here. Uh, Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, I just would like to make a motion that we limit debate for the meeting to two minutes and two questions per board members and that Tracy time us in the um, interest of time. Thank you. So is, there, is the proper, um, let me ask our, um, Ms. Bressler, is that a proper motion or does it need to be more specific in terms of suspending our current procedures? Is Ms. Bressler on the call? I don't see Ms. Bressler on the call. Okay, uh, Ms. Howie. Point of order, Madam Chair. Could you please ask participants to mute their mics? Board members, please be mindful of muting your microphones. Thank you. Ms. Howie, would you be able to address if Ms. Scott's motion is an appropriate motion or do we need to be more specific in suspending um, our current adherence to Robert's Rules of Order? So the motion is in order. It can be a special rule of order for this meeting uh, to limit debate. A motion to limit debate is not out of order if it is to limit debate. Okay, thank you. Is Ms. Cossie, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to divide the question. Excuse I'm me, sorry? Ms. Rowe and then, um, Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Joes. I'd like to divide the question between the limiting of debate and who is going to do the timing. I would like to vote on those items separately. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Howie, is that, do I just agree to that? Is that an amendment to my motion that I have to accept or how does that work? It there hasn't be been a by... second on the motion. I thought Was I Was there a second, second on the motion? I yes, I this is Molly, it's a second. I had Thank a you. second on. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. Gover. And Ms. Howie, the question is, uh, is there, Ms. does there need to be a vote on dividing the question? Ms. Rowe asked that the, the vote be separated so that can be processed either as an amendment or the assembly can simply agree to process uh, the question uh, as one question. Thank you. So if there are no objections, then we will process the question separately I'm sorry, excuse me, is that an amendment? And I just want to understand, is that an amendment that I have to accept? It's amendment. not an amendment. Go ahead, Ms. Howie. Amendments don't have to be accepted. Um, if it's an amendment to the motion, it has to be seconded and voted on. So is that, I guess I'm getting clarification, is that an amendment to the motion or what is that? It doesn't have to be taken or processed as an amendment. Okay, thank you. So again, hearing no objections to dividing the questions, we will move forward with the first part of Ms. Scott's. So Ms. Scott, if you could, you have a second, if you could restate the first item. Um, yes, but I don't want it separated out. I would like my amendment to read as, I move that we limit debate 
for the meeting to two minutes and two questions per board member and that Tracy um, or member of staff um, time us. So it's the, the assembly accepted dividing the questions. So your questions are now divided. So we need to process the first one first and then the second one. Okay. Okay, so if you can state your first question and then board members, we can have discussion and I would just ask us all to be mindful of our time. Correct, thank you. So I move that we limit debate for the meeting to two minutes and two questions per board member. Okay, and I have a clarifying question. Two minutes per agenda item, and then also it would be separate separate as two minutes per motion. Um, I would say two minutes overall. So um, each member would speak for would have the opportunity to speak twice per motion and towards each um, agenda item, giving members a total of four minutes, which if each member speaks, we have 12 members, that would be about 48 minutes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Joes, you have your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? Ms. Joes, are you able to hear me? Do you have a question or a comment because your hand is up? No, it's not. Uh, my hand's not up. Okay, thank you. Thank you for taking that down. Uh, board members, any other questions before we vote on that? Hi, Ms. Gazi. My hand's up. Uh, this is Russ Kuhn. Yes. Um, Ms. Scott, I, I understand, um, I believe, your motion and, and the attempt to help manage the time frame that we, we, we spend in this meeting. But my understanding, based on how we agreed to um, limit three questions and three minutes amongst the members uh, for important topics, I, I thought we had already agreed to that, so I don't quite understand why you're making this motion uh, at this time in the meeting. Could you please explain that? Yes, I can. Thank you for asking. Um, basically, at the last meeting, you're right, we did agree to that, but it was not um, applied equally to all members, and it was haphazardly, and members spoke more than and asked more than three questions, and um, the meetings have um, gone longer than anticipated or scheduled. So I think that in order to make sure that we have some consistency, I feel that a member of staff should time us and that we should um, limit debate because on average, we're asking a approximate about questions that are averaging about an hour to an hour and a half. So I'm looking for some, some consistency and that was the spirit of which this motion was made. Thank you, Ms. Scott. And I just clarify clarify that, um, that what the board had agreed to was the, it would be three minutes per agenda item. And if a board and member can fit in 15 questions in three minutes, then they have their three minutes. So I think the number of questions um, is not an appropriate way to um, to process and to have to, to have it be uh, fair among all the board members when we did agree to three minutes per agenda item. Thank you. But um, what we ran into, though, is it, we, we did not adhere to that at the last meeting and everyone was not equally timed. and. Um, the bell went off for different people, but not it wasn't equally um, distributed amongst all board members. And some board members uh, spoke for longer than three minutes and three questions. So I think in all fairness, that is why I'm suggesting that. And also, um, as far as you're saying inappropriate, I, I think it's inappropriate to have um, elongated meetings that go until 1 a.m. So I think that we need to do everything in our power to make sure that our meetings are fair, sustainable, and um, equal for all board members. Okay, and I would just clarify that based on the last meeting that the timing was consistent except for the last agenda item, which was um, the most significant item. So uh, is there any other comments before we vote on this? Yes, okay. Ms. Causey, I do have a comment. I'm sorry, I just need to follow up. I, I do not believe that it is appropriate 
to limit us to two questions uh, because there could be possible follow-up questions that that beg to be answered. So, I you know, Ms. Scott, I, I support uh, a streamlined meeting, and I do believe that our agenda is actually shorter than it normally is. So I'm hopeful <laughs> that we can, um, you know, definitely yep, get definitely out of here can. at a normal time. Uh, but so, I, I disagree with this, and I'll be voting against it. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. So, members of the board, a motion to limit debate is not in and of itself debatable. Thank you. So we will vote on the current motion of Ms. Scott. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? I, I'm sorry. Can I just ask a clarifying question? This is Erin Hager. If we vote against it, we will be still sticking with the three minutes as previously decided upon. Is that correct? So either way, we're limiting things yes. tonight. Yes. Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. What is the Seven tally, please? Favor. Excuse me? Seven in favor. Okay, thank you. And then the second, uh, the second part of the question, uh, Ms. Scott, if you can restate that, please. Yes, I stated that um, I would like for um, that um, uh, Tracy, our um, uh, staff member designated by the superintendent, um, be responsible for timing members. Thank Second. You. So, thank you, Ms. Joes. So, Ms. Howie, this is uh, debatable in that it is not the motion to limit debate. Is that correct? It is not. While it's not the motion to limit debate, it is related to the motion to limit debate. It can be processed, I think it can be processed as an amendment, but you divided the question. So given that you divided the question, they can be considered independently and therefore you can vote on this um, with, with debate. Board members, again, being mindful of the time. Uh, I see, Ms. Joes, did you want to speak to this? Yes, absolutely. I think at the last meeting, um, the meeting minutes was not belled accurately, equitably, for fairly for everybody. I went and rewatched the meeting. I had spoken only for two minutes and 48 seconds when Ms. Hen rang the bell for the county to hear. Uh, but, you know, there were other members that were speaking, Ms. Mack and repetitive questions that went on for five minutes, six minutes, Mr. Kuhn, and she did not ring the bell consistently. And that was a fair assessment. I got a lot of messages based on that. So I think it's fair that um, a member of the staff maintains the bell because it could be possible that the board members are engaged in listening and may not be able to do two things simultaneously. So I think to make, make it equitable, it should be uh, somebody outside the member of board. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Ms. Hen, and then I see Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would support this motion because it's hard to take time and participate in the meeting. And I didn't enjoy it because I couldn't participate. So I did the best I could. There was no mal um, malice or intent. And as Ms. Causey stated, the last agenda item was not timed because Ms. Pester was the first to speak and I forgot to start the timer. So that wouldn't have been fair to everyone else who spoke after her. So I put in the chat that that's why that agenda item was not timed. Um, like I said, did the best I could, but I'd support this motion any day of the week. So thank you for making it, Ms. Scott. Okay, so next is um, Ms. Rowe. So my only question is, is it appropriate for staff to be the one to time or is that something our parliamentarian should be doing? Um, 
So there's a question, is it appropriate for staff to be doing? And I would ask Ms. Gover to answer that question. And then Ms. Bressler can uh, chime in about whether the parliamentarian should do it, which would be her. Ms. Crosby, um, yes. in all honesty, um, it, it's going to be difficult for me to do as well since I have other tasks to tend to during the board meeting. Thank you. Ms. Bressler? So I'm just joining, and uh, so I need to catch up to the to the subject. Okay, thank you. So at the prior meeting, uh, the board had agreed that we would have uh, time limits of three minutes for board speaking to agenda items, and that they would be timed. And Ms. Hen uh, volunteered to do that, and there is now a motion on the floor to assign that task to Ms. Gover. Uh, however, Ms. Gover has just indicated that that is not functionally pro uh, uh, possible. And so uh, in order to process this um, motion on the floor, uh, I would like to know if it's appropriate for you to be the timer where we are timing board I members. Think, I, yeah, I think, I think anybody can be. It's probably going to be easier for someone who's on the dais um, to be able to to do that, I'm I'm happy to to give it a try. It, when we get back to being in person, I'm sort of not in the center, um, but I mean I'm I'm happy to give it a shot. I, I do it during oral arguments, uh, uh, you know, when uh, or or closing arguments for attorneys all the time. So, okay, thank you. So, with that in mind, Miss Scott. Um, uh, I believe it's appropriate to take a vote on your current motion um, unless, well, let me make an amendment to your motion that it would be Ms. Bressler rather than Ms. Gover. Is there a second to my motion? Second row. Thank you. Board members, I think it's a fairly easy one, so if we could just take a roll call vote, please. This is for the amendment to add Ms. Bressler. Yes. yes. Dr. Hecker. Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahonsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes, so that motion carries. So I will uh, correct myself that we are now limiting board members to two minutes per agenda item. And two questions per board member per agenda item or per motion. Okay. So with that, I had a question. The, uh, Mr. Mahamza? Yeah, I was requesting um, if like a 30 minute warning uh, could be given uh, during the timekeeping. Mr. Mahamza, do you need a 30, 30, 30 second? Seconds. Sorry, 30 seconds. 30 second warning could be given. Ms. Bressler, is that possible? Ms. Bressler, you're muted. Yes, I am muted. So, yes, that's possible. Not a problem. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mahamza. So, now having processed that, the motion stands as amended. The next item on the agenda is earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org board 
slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is new business personnel matters. And for that, we call forward Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, and certificated appointments. Board members, do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So, so moved, moved Mac. Mac. Second, Mac. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Yes. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered in advance to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. While we encourage public input on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of the board and this school mm -hmm. system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you hear the tone. The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may always submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at www.bcps.org slash board slash participation. I will now call on our stakeholder group leaders to speak. This evening we have with us Delegate Pat Young and we invite him uh, to join us and to speak with us. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, and Superintendent Williams. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, briefly address uh, the board. Uh, I want to take an opportunity to thank all of you, uh, one, for listening to your parents, listening to the parents, listening to the experts, uh, and listening to the science related to school opening. I know that no decision that you all make uh, during the pandemic is easy. And I appreciate you taking into consideration all these factors and making sure that our students, teachers, and families are safe during this time. I wanted to, one, on the, I think it's safe to say we are on the eve of a new session. Um, I wanted to make sure that I spoke either in November or December uh, to let you all know that we are aware of the budget situation. Everyone has trepidation related to what is the outlook going to look like and how it's going to affect our public schools. Uh, I have had conversations with uh, <clears throat> Superintendent Williams, and I've appreciated his candor and his uh, input related to our discussions. I serve on the Appropriations Committee, and we'll be taking those into consideration when we're deciding and figuring out how to move forward with the 2021 budget. I encourage all of the members of the board to submit to me as well as to the delegates in their particular areas uh, to let them know the concerns that they have related to the budget. 
and any ideas and suggestions that they have moving forward and what we should be keeping in mind as we go into the 2021 session. I also want to bring to your attention, I don't want to belabor the point because I know that you all have been getting the same concerns that we have related to our students with special needs. Uh, we want to keep everyone safe. Uh, and I know you know this, uh, if there's anything that we can do related to how we can best sort, serve our students that need extra help during this time where we're in a virtual um, teaching in a virtual environment. Um, I am open to assisting in any way that I can, and I know that my members feel the same way. Thank you for the opportunity. My email inbox, my door is virtually open while we're not having one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, uh, but during the legislative session and beyond that, please feel free to contact my office. Uh, and if there's anyone that is also interested in addressing the delegation as we meet in a virtual format as you are during the legislative session, uh, you are welcome to attend and we're welcome to have you. Thank you again, and good luck, and thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Cindy Sexton, president of TABCO. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you, Dr. Williams, Dr. Zarchin, and all the others involved for making the decision to not have students and staff return to school buildings at this time. While I know we have all heard from many people on both sides of this issue, sadly and unfortunately, the COVID numbers in Baltimore County continue to move rapidly in the wrong direction. We all want to be back in our classrooms and teach our students face-to-face but only when that return can be truly safe and sustainable. Thank you also for providing a plan for reopening, whenever that reopening might be. I know the safety is our true north will be shared tonight, and the call for a plan has been loud and clear. I want to be sure that equally loud and clear is that negotiations around working conditions for any school reopening have not been agreed to. The MOU is still being negotiated. And there are many needs and concerns to be addressed, including not just the workload, but PPE, health metrics that would ne necessitate a return to virtual instruction. And the question we get more than almost any other, all the concerns around HVAC systems. While all that is being determined, our educators continue to work extremely hard and longer hours than they have ever worked before to develop rigorous and engaging lessons for our students. Additionally, they do check in on the mental and emotional health of their students daily. Everyone is experiencing COVID fatigue. We all want to go back to our work sites. But sadly and unfortunately, the road ahead of us is going to include COVID. Please remember that our educators are at their limit. Let us be sure that we are also checking in on them. Let us be sure that as we develop instructional plans, reopening plans and more, we continue to have the true collaboration of all the bargaining units. It will take all of us working together to navigate all the challenges we are facing and continue to face. Let us meet those challenges together. Thank you. Stay safe and be well. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Tony Fugit, the president of NAACP of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the board. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Anthony Fugit, and I serve as president of the Baltimore County branch of the NAACP. Equity and inclusion have become the backbone of the work that is being done in the Baltimore County public school system. In that vein, the Randallstown and Baltimore County branches of the NAACP have reviewed the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Uh, we first would like to commend you for putting together a plan, and that is very important to plan ahead given the vast number of resources that are involved in the schools. What we noted was that among the top 10 phase one high schools recommended list, only two high schools lo were located on the west side of the county that made the cut. Catonsville ranked number five and Owings Mills High School ranked number nine. Even so, the recommendations made to the board under Group 2 and 3 consist of high schools located east of I-83. As the board considers the recommendations made by Canon Designs, 
we have to ensure that the equity and inclusion work of the county remains consistent with the needs of our students and its infrastructure. Moving forward, the deliverable for phase two of the multi-year plan is in the spring of 21. This will include the remainder of the schools in the system, including both middle and high schools, or middle and, high, and elementary schools. We at the NAACP want to ensure that all needs of all students in all schools are being considered. The right to an education in a safe, secure, stable building should not depend on the zip code of a student living. These are clearly needs that should be addressed in the western part of our county. And it is our hope that these schools are not left out during the planning of phase two. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're moving on to public comment. And again, I would remind our um, contributors that they have three minutes. So first is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening and welcome. So first is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Teachers demand the school system to be closed. Parents demand the school systems to open up. CAPCO wants to know all the fine details before they sign on to the plan. The reality is that BCPS lacks the funds for making and creating excellent education. We have only 26 Blue Ribbon schools. Gibran Khalil Gibran is an American poet of Syrian origin like me. And he said, you give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. How many parents or companies donated to PCPS? Very few, very little. How many parents gave BCPS endowment funds to build schools? Very few, very little. We cannot build a ship out of bamboo sticks. I believe the Board of Education needs to be in control, needs to be independent, so you can make the schools safe and effective, so you may be able to make all schools blue ribbon schools. My proposal to you Honorable Board of Education members, for you to lobby the state and the county to give you the tax levying authority. I do propose that administration administer and the teachers teach and the parents to give of themselves to BCPS. I have participated in BCPS for almost 25 years. I have seen appointed Board of Education for so many decades. No one in the past imagined that we will have hybrid Board of Education. Now we do. BCPS needs to be independent of the first-string politics. Together, we can make all BCPS blue ribbon schools. Thank you all for your work. And thank you again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Mohammed Jamil. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Participants, please mute their phones. Dr. Jamil, are you with us? Could you call on the next participant, Ms. Causey, and I will get him back on the phone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening. 
Karen Sterol. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Miss Sarah, are you able to be on the line with us? Are you able to? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so let's try that again. Okay. 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 Mr. Corns, is there guidance you can give on this feedback that we are hearing? I just turned off my TV. Can you hear me now? That is, yes, very clear. Thank you. Okay. This afternoon, our governor held a press conference. Maryland's numbers are going up. Our positivity rate is above 5% and is rising daily. Restrictions have increased, and more schools, including small private and non-public schools, have decided to go back to 100% virtual learning. Last week, BCPS paused its plans to open up the four public separate day schools. I want to commend you on that. Now is not the time to focus on opening schools. As I have previously stated, the focus should be on making the virtual learning work better. So how do we do this? We should start by not treating the virtual environment in the same way we treat the classroom learning. All classroom staff, therapists included, need to have a computer and all software necessary to assist students in, the learning, in this learning process. I have heard from many paraeducators that they are still not being provided with the necessary tools to assist both teachers and students in the virtual environment. This also goes for therapists. This needs to include, all students should include the necessary tools also. They need to have paper items, manipulatives, as well as computers and software. All IEPs and 504s should be followed at the service level prior to the pandemic. I'm hearing way too many people not getting therapies one-on-one -on -one as per the IEP. We can do virtual learning directly. We can do, provide therapies directly. Consult is not the same as direct. We should be providing one-on-one -on -one and small group sessions if necessary. I've been to many a breakout room. I have been to many a one-on-one. -on -one. I watch these things virtually at least once a week. We can do this. Let us not forget our gifted learners who need to cha be challenged and provided work at their level and pace. Friday is the end of the first quarter. We need to stop thinking this is the best we can do with virtual learning. We need to think out of the box and collaborate to improve the new environment. We can do this, BCPS. I've already seen it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Mary Taylor. Good evening. Mr. Jamil. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So we will now go back to uh, uh, Mr. Jamil. Yes. Peace and blessings, Chair, Madam Causey, Dr. Williams, members of the board, and all those attending this meeting. Congratulations to all of my fellow citizens who participated and fulfilled their duty 
to participate in our democratic process last Tuesday. Before I became a citizen of these United States of America, I had difficulty in pledging allegiance to a flag instead of to the country and to its constitution. I learned that the reason of taking this oath to the flag was to the country that began with 13 colonies represented by the number of red and white stripes, which united as 50 states represented by the number of the white shining stars under the blue skies. This oath is an affirmation and belief represented by five most important words. First, belief in God. Second, Belief in one nation that will not be divided. Third, belief in republic, where the governance is by the people and by their representatives. Fourth, belief in liberty, which is personal, intellectual, economic, and political freedom, which is best explained in the Bill of Rights. The fifth one is belief belief in justice, which is to be dispensed equally by their representatives of all inhabitants who have liberty in this one nation that exists as a republic under God. We recite the Pledge of Allegiance right. repeated the fifth one as is a belief, belief in justice that we are and that we will uphold this oath. Chair Ms. Causey, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board, my intention here is to remind you that when you vote on the calendar 2021-22, it is your duty as our representatives to uphold the oath of equal justice. You justly recognize and approve scheduling the one Muslim holiday on the date when all students will be off. Please remember the oath taken in the beginning of the meeting. Now it appears that the justice to the Muslim students is at stake. Please reconsider the alternatives and not sacrifice this holiday. God bless. Thank you very much for listening to me. Are we up to Mary Taylor now? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Ms. Taylor. Good evening. On November 2nd, a mass email was sent to Dr. Sargin and the Baltimore County Board of Education members requesting representation on the BCPS design team and stakeholder recovery group. On November 9th, Dr. Zarchin's reply stated that Dr. Williams receives input from those two groups, which also includes a very variety of action groups. Good evening. Again, my name is Mary Taylor, founder and admin of an action group on Facebook called Reopen Baltimore County Public Schools. We have over 2,200 members who are concerned and very aggressive parents, and we're growing that membership every day. Who is advocating for our students? How many members of the 47 are speaking up for the 110,000 plus kids? Is anyone discussing the excessive amount of screen time for our kids? The isolation, the anxiety, the depression, the behavior changes, the decrease in grades, the reports of increased incidence of abuse and neglect. We've heard from parents whose children have IEPs or 504s that their kids are not receiving a free and appropriate education, FAPE, F-A-P-E that is legally guaranteed to them through the Individual with Disabilities and Education Act, IDEA, IDEA. Who's speaking for the low-income single parents or special needs families that feel like they're being ignored or discriminated against? Why the lack of transparency? There are 47 members of two committees, Stakeholder Recovery Group and BCPS Design Team. Of that, all five bargaining units are representative. There are teachers on the committee, but all of them are union members, and there's one PTA representative. There are no parents or students that we can identify. We have asked for minutes from these committees to be shared. We were told they do not take minutes at the COVID-19 tax force and BCS reopening stakeholder committee meetings. We were told that the design team minutes are not required to be disclosed. Why the lack of non-transparency? 
We cannot waste any more time. Kids should have been in school since September. We've lost two and a half months of valuable in-person learning as a result of government fear-mongering, unreasonable demands, and failed leadership. We are very concerned that our request was denied by Dr. Sartin. That should not be a closed group, nor should it be a group represented by just unions and like-minded people. We want a voice. What do we expect? Reopen Baltimore County Public School Group is once again asking for representation of five members, one from each advisory area, to be placed on both the BCPS design team and the stakeholder recovery group. We're asking Dr. Williams, Dr. Zarchin, and the members of the Board of Education to please respect and approve our request for representation effective immediately. Thank you for your time and your consideration this evening, and we look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. And our next speaker that is lined up is Miss Lucy Creel. Miss Creel, are you with us? Yes. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good yes, evening. we can. My name, my name is Lucy Creel. I'm part of a grassroots movement called Reopen BCPS. Baltimore County Public Schools is in a state of complete chaos. I, like many parents listening, am at the end of my rope. Parents and teachers are fighting amongst each other in disagreement. If someone questions why isn't there a plan to go back to in-person learning, another will scream, why are you trying to kill children and teachers? If there was a plan in place, we could fight each battle as it comes but we are still at home waiting. COVID is here to stay, but two things make it even worse, ignorance and fear. <laughs> it feels unreal that we are at eight months in the school door closed world with no plan in place. The steps BCPS has taken is an overreaction to the virus when other places are attempting to have some sort of normalcy. We speakers all take the time to write these thoughts out to be heard. But are we just yelling into the void? How is a single parent of elementary school students supposed to keep their job and make sure their kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing? How are parents of older children supposed to keep their kids on task when they work outside the home? How are parents supposed to support their children with IEPs not receiving free and appropriate education? Why aren't their needs being met? How are our GT students supposed to keep them challenged and interested? How are parents supposed to log in without reliable hotspots or internet? How is the possibility of getting sick from COVID greater than the mental wellness of our children, our parents, our teachers? How is six hours of screen time okay now? What happened to under two hours? How is sitting in a crowded airplane or going to Sky Zone okay, but the kids can't be in a classroom once a week at this point? Why are children being used as political pawns? What are the long-term effects of this? Divorce, recession, abuse, suicide, foreclosures? I will leave you with this. Parents should not be avoided. Parents should be on these planning committees, not teacher union members sabotaging any hope of return. Oh Saying that we are represented is a brush off. Parents are angry with a lack of transparency and it is insulting. We are taxpayers. We need to see these individual schools getting fully prepared to open their doors in January. No less is a disservice to the community. We are all watching. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And our next speaker is Mr. Jeffrey Friedman. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh -huh. No problem. Board members, as a veteran educator, I would like to speak with you about two topics tonight. First, I'd like to express how disheartened and upset I felt when listening to the public comment at the last board meeting. 
number of people pleaded with you at all costs to open schools without any regard to health and safety. Some stated that if we can go shopping or go out to restaurants, then we should be able to open schools and that teachers are going out and taking risks but not wanting to return to schools. I can tell you from the vast majority of people I know this is so far from the truth and that many of us are simply working to protect ourselves and our families. It is unfortunate, but many members of the public truly do not understand the inherent risks to public health and safety that we must appropriately plan for when reopening schools. As teachers who work in classrooms with a number of students for a prolonged period of time, many of these classrooms do not have adequate ventilation. We work with all students, many of whom have behavioral challenges on a normal day without considering the pandemic. It only takes one student being sent into schools with symptoms and refusing to wear a mask to make a number of teachers and students sick. We've seen outbreaks in a number of schools to our east in Hartford County. Please remember that lives are at risk and we still do not know how being infected will affect our health in the future. When I recently polled my students, approximately 90% of them told me that they would not feel safe returning to school until a safe and effective vaccine is available for everyone. I agree that this makes sense since we know that vaccines help stop outbreaks. I know that there is much pressure from both sides of this debate, but we cannot afford to get this wrong. I was pleased to learn about all of the planning taking place to ensure a safe transition to in-person learning and the release of the Safety as Our True North document last week. However, this collaboration to develop the appropriate guidelines for opening and closing schools needs to continue. Meanwhile, while planning for reopening schools have changed a number of times due to the virus, there's much anxiety among teachers, students, and families with when this transition will begin. Several other counties, such as Anne Arundel and Howard, have simply voted to keep learning 100% virtual through the end of the second marking period in January. For the sake of consistency, I would like to ask the board to make a motion tonight to do that again so that everyone can plan accordingly. We can then take the time to get this right and reassess the situation in January. I would also like to see an additional motion to provide the discussed third option for educators where the, those with high-risk health conditions and those caring for high-risk family members can choose to teach the students who opt for full virtual learning once schools reopen. I was pleased to hear three board members asking about this, and I feel that it is time to make this motion and vote to approve it. If you do not do this, you are likely to lose a large number of our fantastic BCPS educators. Lastly, I'd like to remind you that around 300 teachers, students, parents, and members of the community have signed a petition asking you to vote to start next school year after Labor Day. Please protect the summer, give time for school buildings to be prepared, and keep in line with surrounding counties who are already planning to start after Labor Day next year. We are counting on you for your votes to make this happen tonight. Thank you. And our next speaker is Ms. Diana Berkman. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Diana Bergman. I'm a parent of three BCPS students. And today, in good faith efforts to bring awareness to transparency, accountability, and the duties of the responsibilities to the public of the BCPS Board of Ed should consider the suggestions I'm about to share regarding reopening of our schools. In recent events, the board chair created a new ad hoc committee. While many stakeholders are relieved that to such action taken previously by the board chair. It is extremely important that the public is aware that an ad hoc committee are not considered a public body subject to the Open Meetings Act. Standing committees such as the Curriculum Committee that do fall under the purview to meet compliance with the Open Meetings Act provides the public reassurance of transparency, accountability, and observation of public access to see if the Board of Ed is doing their duties to serve the public. In fairness, ad hoc committees of us are still important to help the board members discuss this, a specific topic, to review and make recommendations to the board as a whole. However, when we dive deep to look at the expenses associated with having multiple committees that is addressing the same specific topic to review and make recommendations to bring forward before the whole board, it begins to get expensive, and it does come across as counterproductive. Just take a second to explain the logic of having standing committees address the current reopening of schools and discuss and plan how the curriculum will be accessible and implemented during a pandemic. To be told once again the postponement of your committee reports after another nine hour long time meeting to conduct Board of Ed business. Right after everybody is exhausted, here comes an introduction of a new ad hoc committee doing the exact same thing your standing committee was working diligently on. 
I'm deeply, I'm deeply concerned as to why undermine our educators who are working diligently to make the needs of our whole system the school system functions. Board meetings, regardless of their health, during closed sessions or open sessions, require their legal counsel to be present. And the current Board of Ed has a non-salary operating budget. The non-salary operating expenditure report was recently released to the public. The report had identified seven summaries of results, one being that in FY19, the operating budget was overspent. I'm concerned that the excessive spending habits of the previous year is continuing currently. And I remember when our state superintendent shared her biggest fear with the Ways and Means Committees in front of the General Assembly, and her biggest fear that we would not have enough money to safely bring every student back to school. I don't want to see the Board of Ed overspent again on their operating budget when our school system needs to use every single penny wisely. As a parent, a taxpayer, and an active participating stakeholder, I want to make sure that our board is being feasible, responsible, transparent, held accountable in the manner that the Board of Ed does their due diligence when conducting board business. And our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Amy Adams. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm a parent of three BCPS students and one of the 2,200 concerned parents in a Facebook group, group called Reopen BCPS. I'm at a point where I do not trust or have faith in the leadership in charge of our students' education. Do you know that BCPS is down 3,845 students and counting? This will be a loss of approximately 15 million from the state and 13 million from the county government for a total loss of $28 million. Do the collective bargaining units realize how devastating this loss in funding will be for our teachers? Students who cannot afford to leave the public schools will be left to deal with the consequences of this. This means we are harming the minority students and poor students even more. Where is the equity in that? It's time for all leaders to address the fear. It has been used to paralyze our school system. Other systems in the state have had some option for in-person learning up to this point. Baltimore City is planning to educate students in person despite the city placing more restrictions on the community. Schools in Pennsylvania have been open since August. Their statewide positivity rate is currently 7.6, which is above our 5.24%. Catholic and private schools in Baltimore County have been open since September. I've not heard of any widespread outbreak of the virus at these schools or related hospitalizations. I've been watching and looking for this information. There is clear data to show the virus does not spread at the same rate in schools as it does in communities. We know the virus spreads. The rate of transmission is extremely low if students and teachers are masked and socially distant. Even if one of them sneezes or coughs with a mask on, the rate of transmission is low. This needs to be the message given to all staff. Stop with the fear tactics. The metrics are being used against us. Baltimore County met the metrics to return to school since mid-September, and only in the last week have we seen an increase. There was no focus on the metrics when they were good, only on them when they support keeping schools closed. BCPS was given $51 million from the CARES Fund, which was signed into law on March 27th. I have searched the budget and active contracts and only found five items totaling $2.2 million asking to use this money. This money expires on December 30th. How can BCPS not take advantage of this aid and use the other $48 million? Yesterday, the county executive promised $11 more million to go directly to the BCPS principals for PPE, cleaning supplies, and air purifiers. Didn't Dr. Williams already state we have adequate supply of PPE and cleaning products for all our schools? Have the schools been walked through and surveyed for readiness? Something is not adding up, and we parents and students deserve to know who is in charge and what you are doing to get our kids back in school. It appears from the outside looking in, no one is motivated to open schools anytime soon. It appears that the leadership and the union leaders do not care about the students. It appears that BCPS students could potentially be locked out of school until September 2021, and that is just unacceptable. Thank you for your time. And our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Darren Padillo. Good evening. That's correct. Listening? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. My name is Darren Badillo, the director of the Baltimore Youth Coalition. But most importantly, I'm a father and also represent over 2,200 parents in reopened Baltimore County. Virtual learning is not working and not having proper ventilation 
could have been addressed eight months ago and is now being used as an excuse. I have not seen one leader in charge of opening our schools here in Baltimore County since the pandemic share any data or information about successfully school openings in our country or any country. I see a lot of leaders posting opinions and feelings. We cannot make decisions based off of personal feelings, but facts. And the fact is, two miles from Baltimore County, schools in Baltimore City were planning on opening and just scaled back those plans. Baltimore County has not even got that far yet. And I disagree with county executives calling Governor Hogan to implement statewide COVID-19 restrictions, which continue to keep kids home and continues virtual learning. The fact is many children are seeking help about suicidal thoughts. Many children with IEPs are not receiving, receiving faith, a free and appropriate education legally guaranteed to them through IDEA, which is the Individual with Disabilities and Education Act. Virtual learning is not an appropriate platform for most children with IEPs, as well as children pre-K through second grade. They're far behind and can barely read, let alone know how to manage a computer. Also, we have many parents complaining about websites shutting down. Kids are not getting a proper education. We think we know what kids are going through. We have no idea. Have there been any studies on the effects of virtual learning? Michael Martin, the Irish prime minister, said that while his country could no longer avoid restrictions, they're shutting Europe down despite the detrimental to impact on the economy. But it's vital that schools remain open. We cannot allow our children and young people's future to be another victim of this disease. They need their education. Around the world, there is mounting concern that the pandemic is doing lasting harm to the academic and edu educational and emotional development of an entire generation of children, and medical experts point to many things that they now know that were unknown back in spring. With proper precaution, the rate of coronavirus transmission in school is, very, uh, is relatively low. The fact is virtual learning is not working, and we need to stop acting like it is. The fact is, prior to COVID, Baltimore County was below the national average for reading level. The fact is, lower income areas and schools were suffering before COVID, and now those students are devastated by virtual learning and not being in school. The fact is, leaders and decision makers are focused on plans to keep our kids out of school. We have private and Christian schools in Baltimore County successfully teaching kids for months. Get to work. Stop putting up smoke screens with fake promises just to keep pushing the date back on things just to keep us silent. And lastly, you cannot tell me or parents in Baltimore County. Many things are open. Let's open the schools. Do the right thing. We the parents. And our next speaker is Ms. Sarah Russell. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah Russell, and I am the mother of two B's DPS students. My youngest is in first grade, and my oldest is in fifth grade. I sincerely appreciate having the ability to address the board tonight regarding my concerns with the lack of transparency in and confusion around the process by which B's DPS will consider reopening our schools and when. First, though, I want to acknowledge the tremendous efforts of the faculty, administrators, and staff at Riderwood Elementary School. I know what they are dealing with in this virtual learning environment is every bit as difficult as it is for students and parents. I do believe they are working with my children's best interests at heart and are spending an extraordinary amount of extra time supporting both their educational and social emotional needs. However, we are now in our 10th week of the 2020 school year with my children spending in excess of six hours in front of a computer screen, a reality which is not healthy for children of any age, let alone elementary school. Over the past two weeks, my children have gone to bed every night asking me whether they really have to go to school the next day. They wake up asking me the same question. It is heartbreaking. I try to empathize, but remain firm, saying, yes, you must sit in front of your computer all day for school. This inevitably leads to arguments and tears. But let me be clear. Our teachers are not the problem, and they are a significant part of the reason we are able to make this situation work right now. I registered to speak this evening because we need a more streamlined path to reopening our schools and more impactful leadership. While I greatly appreciate the board members that have stepped up to pass motions requiring a plan by a certain date, this should have happened sooner, and we are now paying the price for not reopening schools earlier in the year. 
Because of all the wasted time, we need a fully vetted and clear plan that can be implemented when the metrics are acceptable, just like Montgomery County and others. Further, having committees responsible for making a plan that are comprised of double-digit members makes the group too large to function effectively. This is well documented in studies about the function and efficacy of corporate boards and nonprofit organizations alike. Yes, it is crucial to have stakeholder input, but that input can be a reaction to a plan put, smart, put forth by a smaller committee. Further, any stakeholder input shouldn't only include the collective bargaining units, but parents as well. How do you get parental input? Perhaps by releasing a meaningful survey. The surveys you have been releasing are inconsequential. You are not asking the right questions. You are not able to tell from your questions about video streaming and if students are feeling engaged and supported, whether people want to return to school. You also cannot possibly be tracking who is responding because I could have answered that survey an infinite amount of times saying my children attended any school in the system and at any grade. If privacy is a concern, there are ways to randomize the survey to eliminate personally identifying information while ensuring the person taking the survey is who you think they are. I also think the board needs to be more transparent with parents and faculty. That concludes our public comment portion of the meeting. Additionally, during this time, we also accept written comment. And if you go to our board docs, uh, there are um, emails that were sent in through the process, the proper process, and are attached to board docs with additional comments from our stakeholders. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, we call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, board members. Uh, Madam Chair, Causey, and Vice Chair Hen, I'd like to begin tonight by highlighting what we've accomplished together um, during this new day in education. As we end our first marking period this week, I offer both thanks and encouragement to the Team BCPS family. Our educators and leaders are providing engaging and supportive virtual lessons to students all across the county. Our students are working hard from their homes and child care locations. Uh, we are supporting students through intentional social emotional learning to support their health and well-being, along with one-to-one -one devices as we look at kindergarten through grade 12 and meals at no cost at more than 300 locations. So I want to thank the team. Since my report to you last month, BCPS was recognized at a global creativity conference called Adobe Max for bringing the community together through art. Our Office of Visual Arts has coordinated three exhibits since the spring closure, spotlighting student artwork as well as art created by parents and staff. And there's more good news. 12 of our high schools were named among the region's 50th best by niche based on academic data and ratings. Congratulations to all of our principals, students, staff, and school communities for this hard work. It's National School Psychology Week, and it's my honor to celebrate our school psychologists, especially during this time, mental health supports are so critical to student wellness. Uh, take a look at our blog for highlights each day this week of BCPS school psychologists. And due to the rise in COVID-19 infections, uh, we announced last week that we must delay reopening the four public separate day schools until we meet the state and local health metrics. I know how important it is for families to have the option of some in-person learning. Our health and safety guidelines, known as safety is our true north, are available on www.bcps.org, along with a summary of last week's data. Uh, we will continue monitoring data with the Baltimore County Health Department and will provide updates as they are available. Uh, tonight, staff will present a plan for reopening school buildings for preschool through grade two, once again, keeping health and safety at the forefront. Um, we will be able to proceed uh, once we continue to monitor the health metrics and making sure they are met. 
I also want to comment, I was able to visit the four public separate day schools last week. Uh, thank you to our principals, Missy Beltron at Rich Ruxin uh, School, along with her AP, Yanina Giller. Also at White Oak School, Principal Allison Myers. Uh, at Battle Monument, Principal uh, Jerry Easterly Jr. and his AP, uh, Tayton Whitson and then Maiden Choice School, Dr. Nancy Berganti and her AP, Catherine West. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and applaud our county executive, Ocheski, for yesterday's announcement. The county committed uh, $11.5 million in CARES Act funding for BCPS principals to prepare for reopening. Uh, up to $100 per student will be available for personal protective and equipment, cleaning and sanitizing products, air purifiers, and other equipment or supplies that will help ensure that school buildings are safe for students, educators, and staff. We have always been able to count on our county government, and it's wonderful to have this direct support. Uh, since this is my last report to you before Thanksgiving, I would like to wish everyone a safe and healthy holiday. And I'm certainly thankful for our community and how we've come together to support students during this crisis. This concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to um, this evening hear from the student member of the board. Mr. Josh Muhamza. Mr. Mahamza. I don't see him on the call, Ms. Causey. Okay, thank you. He's coming back now. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello. Good evening, Chair Causey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Beginning November 1st, an important milestone for many of our 12th grade students was reached, their first college application deadline. Tonight, I bring your attention to this very important matter. For 18 years in their lives, our seniors have been uh, continuously uh, looking forward to this period, uh, to this deadline through uh, from uh, making plans for post uh, high school, whether it's uh, college, uh, trade, career, or the armed forces, our soon-to-be graduates make the best choices for themselves. One of the first things that we do as uh, young adults. Baltimore County for years has placed an emphasis on preparing our students to be successful in their future endeavors. And for the most part, we have done a tremendous job. I am solely speaking on this matter tonight because I want to remind our school leaders and individual school, uh, educators on how fragile this period is for our seniors. With uh, And this year, with the added uh, challenges of the pandemic, uh, this has just exacerbated uh, much of their apprehensions. This year, uh, our students not only have to worry about college deadlines and its many components, uh, keeping up with their schoolwork and their extracurriculars, but they also have to uh, worry about uh, not having a completed application due to uh, uh, postponements with SATs and other standardized tests, keeping up, uh, getting new information from uh, various colleges, and being able to properly uh, solicit uh, letters of recommendations from their teachers, and just the added stress uh, to their motion, uh, added a stress due to uh, the uh, online learning. Although our schools provide a plethora of resources to help uh, ease the, uh, this very daunting process, uh, and certainly families play, play an important role, many of our students, especially those of lower socioeconomic backgrounds and those who attend 
who attend schools with less opportunities uh, have a harder time and sometimes uh, are forgotten in the process. Many of the students have aspirations like any other student, but because of uh, lack of opportunities uh, to be prepared for the test, for the standardized test, uh, not knowing about certain uh, information concerning college uh, applications, uh, career and uh, the armed forces, uh, some of them don't uh, even uh, take to participate in this process. I ask that when we're discussing uh, college and career ready for our seniors, that we also not forget these uh, students and reach out to some students that who are struggling. And we should not only focus on graduation requirements, we should also fo uh, focus on what those students will do at the end following their graduation. I know that other board members have talked about this at length. Um, Miss Mack, for one, who talks about our students um, being in math and reading proficient uh, as the years go by. And she talks about how a student can be uh, left behind if they are not proficient uh, in these subjects at an early age. So I just hope that we can remedy these uh, these problems before we get and uh, as they go through high school and eventually their college application, because that really um, to be detrimental to them. So that will be my only uh, comment for tonight. And uh, like Dr. Williams said, I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and I look forward to a productive meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's the time for the chief report. So first I want to say I uh, want to dovetail with Dr. Williams on all the important work that's being done and all of the important things that are going on this month. And then I want to jump right in uh, and address what is really on everyone's mind. And the first thing I want to say is I want to say thank you to my board colleagues. Uh, we are all uh, impacted by COVID, and yet uh, the, the board members individually and collectively remain committed to serving, serving our students, our staff, and our communities to try and provide the best education that we can under these circumstances. We have seven parents on the Board of Education, as well as three retired educators, each with over 30 years in BCPS. And we have a student member of the board from whom you just heard. So last week, the uh, board made some significant uh, actions, and one of them had to do with the directive uh, for having the superintendent and his team develop a reopening plan for students in pre-K through second grade at a minimum. There is always the opportunity for the superintendent to bring recommendations to the board on um, the other student groups that were outlined earlier in the first plan, the reopening plan. Um, and so that we're, I look forward and the board looks forward to hearing that tonight. The board has heard from all of our stakeholders we have received thousands and thousands of emails. However, the recent survey that was distributed did not provide the board with the information and data we need in an organized and comprehensive method for the best decision making. There's two aspects to the survey uh, that our ad hoc committee is developing. And one is to improve virtual learning, which we need to have as we need to adjust to the uh, impacts of COVID, where we may at any time need to have certain cohorts or entire schools in a virtual learning environment. But the second aspect of the survey is to understand the information we need to develop a plan, the best plan for reopening our schools. And let's keep in mind, I want everyone to know that reopening of schools will only occur when the health metrics indicate that it is safe. And those health metrics are well-defined on our website um, in reports, and you'll hear more about them in the item reopening of schools. Um, and I'm grateful to Dr. Erin Hager, who is volunteering her time and expertise uh, in doing this ad hoc committee. Um, and she's uh, jump-started that, and I look forward to that. And she will be seeking input from a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> 
The next, I wanted to say that I do uh, appreciate the additional funding from the county executive that prioritizes uh, anything that is needed in order to safely reopen schools and that it gives the principals the perspective of providing their communities and their schoolhouses with what they need. I do want to mention also that our standing committees, we have currently five standing committees, and all of those are open virtually to the public, and they are also recorded and live streamed, and you can access all of that on our website. And those committee updates are coming later tonight. Uh, additionally, this year is pivotal, pivotal as the Policy Review Committee is reviewing our ethics policies, and we're going to uh, have those updated to current law, clarified, strengthened, and we'll be looking to our ethics review panel for discussions and recommendations. At the next meeting, I will be acknowledging members who have completed their service in this important role and acknowledging the new members who have recently been appointed. Um, and in the interest of time, I will just finish my remarks with saying um, it is my opportunity to say happy Thanksgiving to everyone. And even though there are so many challenges at this time, I do hope and the board hopes that we all are able to have a special time and really uh, focus on our blessings and those positive things that are in our life. And that is the end of my report. So the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And Ms. Bressler, there was no action taken in closed session. Right, Thank so you. my report is very brief. There was no action. Thank you. You're welcome. And the next item on the agenda is item J, unfinished business, update on reopening of schools. And for that, we call on Dr. Williams. So good evening. Uh, this evening, we have uh, Dr. Mary Boswell McComas coming forward, Ms. Christina Byers, Dr. Raquel Jones, and Dr. George Roberts to give an update on the request from the board. So to the team, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I think we're just in the process of getting the um, PowerPoint up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corns. So good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. For this evening's presentation, I am joined by my colleagues, Dr. Boswell McComas, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Roberts. At the board's meeting on October, October 27th, the board passed a motion regarding students in grades pre-K through grade two returning to a regularly scheduled, safe, in-person instructional environment. As you are all aware, on September 16th, 2020, the Maryland State Department of Education approved the reopening plan for Baltimore County Public Schools. Mm -hmm. That plan, in accordance with Maryland Together, the Maryland State Department of Education Recovery Plan, focuses on promoting the health, the welfare, and the safety of our students, staff, and families while maximizing learning. Next slide, please. Thank you. As outlined in our MSDE approved plan posted on September 16th, our hybrid approach to instruction will prioritize bringing identified and targeted students back for in-person instruction on a rotating basis while still offering parents the choice of a full-time virtual learning approach. As outlined on this slide, Baltimore County Public Schools has created a plan that will phase in small groups of students through a targeted, prioritized manner based on the complexity of student needs and pedagogical strategy. Our phased-in approach begins with our students in our public separate day schools. The detailed plan for our public separate day schools was posted to our website on November 4th, 2020. It is incorporated in the BCPS re-entry plan as Appendix K. Phase two in our approach includes all students in preschool through grade two, irrespective of their least restrictive environment. Phase three 
we'll bring back our students in grades three through 12, whose least restrictive environment is outside of the general education classroom setting. In addition, in that phase, students in select CTE programs would re-enter school based on the needs for hands-on instruction aligned to credentialing. And then finally, our plan outlines in phase four that all students in grades three through 12, irrespective of their least restrictive environment, would re-enter school through a hybrid model. As always, the timeline for implementation for re-entry of students groups is contingent upon the status of our public metrics and through our consultation with the Baltimore County Health Department. The remainder of this presentation this evening is going to highlight the details of our reentry plan that addresses reentry for the student groups that are part of phase two. Next slide, please. In the same way that our detailed plan for the public separate day schools was published as part of that overall reentry plan, our detailed plan for re-entry for students in phase two also lives inside that global BCPS re-entry plan. It will be published as Appendix M of that plan. So Appendix M preschool through grade two is organized into three parts. Part one, health and safety, will address health metrics, mitigation strategies, screening, PPE, ventilation, our health services protocols, safety plans and drills in a hybrid environment, and social emotional learning for our students. Part two of the plan addresses our system and school operations. Those operations include determining hybrid or virtual instruction, our questionnaire process, cohort development, parent drop-off and pickup, transportation, specifically on our school buses, food and nutrition service, attendance procedures in a hybrid model, and protocols for visitors to our buildings. And then finally, part three addresses components related to our instructional model. Those components include class assignments and staff considerations, cohort changes, school scheduling, the hybrid instructional materials that will be used, modified synchronous instructional schedules, general teacher and student expectations, the delivery of services to our ESOL students in a hybrid model, special education services in a hybrid model, processes for staffing substitutes and our temporary employees, classroom layouts and assessment. So at this time, my colleague, Dr. Raquel Jones, is going to share with you critical highlights of part one of the plan, health and safety. Next slide, and I will turn things over to Dr. Jones. Good evening, and thank you, Ms. Byers. Part one of the preschool through grade two reopening plan is focused on health and safety. This section of the plan contains nine components. This evening, we will review five of the health and safety components as shown on the slide. The first component is metrics. Based on the governor's press conference today at 5 p.m., including the Maryland Department of Health new public health advisory and, important, and the importance of monitoring all the metrics, Baltimore County Public Schools will continue to evaluate health metrics and plans for reopening schools. In addition, Baltimore County Public Schools remains in constant communication with the Baltimore County Health Department. Guidance reported by the governor, state agencies, and the County Health Department will continue to be reviewed and monitored. Updates regarding health metrics will be provided based on the evolving nature of this pandemic. The metrics in the preschool through grade two reopening plan are based on Maryland Department of Health and Maryland State Department of Education metrics. Baltimore County Public Schools will implement it, its opening re, reopening plan when the county positivity rate is 5% or lower and the case rate per 100,000 residents is below 15. The direction and pace of reopening will be guided by two primary indicators, cumulative cases per 100,000 persons over 14 days to provide a measure of the extent of the disease in Baltimore County 
and percent change in the new cases per 100,000 persons over seven days to provide a measure of trends. These two measures will allow the system to gauge the extent of the disease in the community and the overall trend will be called the COVID-19 school opening score. More details surrounding this process are included in the plan. The Baltimore County Health Department and Baltimore County Public Schools meet weekly to discuss recommendations about whether to continue the gradual reopening of schools, pause the reopening for a week, or stop the reopening plan and consider a return to remote learning. Except in situations involving a rapid increase in cases, decisions to pause or stop the reopening plan will occur only after two consecutive weeks of concerning metrics. Again, Baltimore County Public Schools will continue to evaluate health metrics and plans for reopening. BCPS remains in constant communication with the Baltimore County mm -hmm. Health Department Guidance reported by the governor, state agencies, and county health department will continue to be will continue to be reviewed and monitored. And updates regarding health metrics will be provided based on the evolving nature of this pandemic. Next, we will move to mitigation strategies. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, identified five key mitigation practices that schools should use to slow the spread. First, consistent and correct use of mass, face masks. Second, social distancing to the extent possible. Third, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. Fourth, cleaning and disinfecting. Fifth, contact tracing in collaboration with the local health department. A mitigation checklist developed from these practices was developed by the BCPS yep. Division of School Climate and Safety and included and is included as a linked document in the plan for access by school leadership and staff. The preschool through grade two reopening plan contains detailed strategies for each of the CDC mitigation practices. Personal protection equipment. PPE is also a component within part one, health and safety. In collaboration with medical experts at the Baltimore County Department of Health, BCPS staff reviewed CDC and Occupational Safety and Health Administration guidelines regarding PPE and developed guidance documents on appropriate PPE for classroom and for classroom staff and for school nurses. Some of the PPE that will be provided to school staff includes KN95 masks for school health personnel, face shields for all staff, gloves and gowns for staff who may come in contact with bodily fluids or who are working with students and or staff with COVID-19 illness. Ventilation. The heating, ventilating, and air conditioning HVAC systems in the schools were all designed and tested by professional mechanical or electrical engineers and by qualified HVAC manufacturing companies in accordance with applicable local and national codes and guidelines. Upon installation, they were tested and balanced by licensed and qualified mechanical contractors to ensure proper operation. These systems are operated and maintained by qualified in-house and contracted technicians, as well as qualified HVAC manufacturers to ensure optimum performance. Related actions since the beginning of the pandemic have been guided by the CDC guidelines and recommendations and those from the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers for minimizing the risk of the spread. A link to this document is also included in the reopening plan. Lastly, health services protocols. Each school is staffed with a full-time registered school nurse. Every school has identified an isolation room. Students who develop symptoms of COVID-19 during the school day will be cared for in the isolation room until they are picked up by parents. Consistent protocols will be followed and are outlined in our health and safety plan. More detailed information regarding components of part one of the preschool through grade two reopening plan can be found under health and safety. At this time, Dr. Roberts will provide information on part two, systems and school operations. Dr. Roberts? Great, thank you, Dr. Jones, and good evening. 
Part two of the pre, uh, preschool to grade two reentry plan covers system and school operations, as you'll see on the next slide, please. This evening, we'll cover in more detail five of the eight components within the system and school operations section. And we'll begin really with the questionnaire process. And the questionnaire process will allow our schools to develop uh, cohorts of students who will be entering uh, potentially into school. So impacted families will be asked to respond to a questionnaire. And in that questionnaire, families will select one of two options. They will either select to return to school on a hybrid schedule with some instruction in the school building and some virtual instruction. If this option is selected, families will also indicate if transportation is needed. Option two will be to continue with full-time virtual instruction. Families with multiple students in one household will complete one survey for each student. And if a family does not indicate a selection, the student will be scheduled to continue with full-time virtual instruction. So related with staff, staff will also receive a questionnaire and staff will be identifiable as they will indicate on their questionnaire the intent to return or apply for a specific accommodation or apply for a specific leave, each of which in consultation with staff in our Division of Human Resources. The results of this questionnaire will result for students in cohort development, which is the next section that you see on the screen. Students will be organized into one of three cohorts, cohort A, and those students in cohort A will attend instruction face-to-face -face on Monday and Tuesday with virtual instruction on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Cohort B students will attend face-to-face -face instruction on Thursday and Friday with virtual instruction on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And cohort C students will attend all virtual instruction. The criteria includes for completing the cohort groups will include um, cohorting students by address. And the reason for this is to ensure that siblings attend school on the same day. Also, schedules for in-person and virtual instruction will be revised and distributed to staff and families by each school. It is important to note that school schedules, when mailed, will continue to meet all MSDE requirements for synchronous and asynchronous instruction. So as we continue into the third section of part two, system school operations for transportation, several components under transportation. The first of which would be bus operations. Our buses will operate in a limited capacity based on the current social distancing guidelines at the time. School system procedures for contact tracing will be followed if a student tests positive for COVID-19 who rides the bus to or from school. In addition, school bus drivers will receive professional learning on mitigation procedures before transportation of students resumes. Another component under transportation relates to face mask and face shields. Bus drivers and bus attendants will wear a face mask that covers their mouth and nose. In addition, students will be required to wear a face mask that covers the mouth and nose during transportation on the school bus. With respect to bus cleaning protocols, Cleaning will involve spraying and wiping the following um, areas of the bus between runs and at the end of the day. Some of those areas include the service door, inside and outside, focusing on the door handles, all seats to include the seat bottoms, seat backs, the top, front, and back. And for students who require safety equipment or special needs, this would also include Bessie seats, safety vests, car seats, star seats, and integrated seats. As we continue to food and nutrition during the school day, the meal service model will include meals served in the classroom and mobile meal sites will continue as necessary to meet the needs of the students who are not present for in-person instruction. So as we talk a little more specifically about meals that are in person within our schools, food will be served using disposable containers, trays and utensils, in addition to a cashless meal payment system will be employed for all of our schools. For breakfast, all students will pick up breakfast on the way into school and eat in the classroom. For lunch, principals will have the option to schedule one of two options for lunch service. Students can eat in the cafeteria by their class cohort as long as they are socially distanced within the cafeteria. They will need to have assigned seats and be monitored by lunchroom assistants and or other school-based staff. Cafeteria tables will be, will be cleaned between students um, as is routine in between lunch services. Option two would be meals would be delivered to the students in the classroom and students similar to breakfast would eat in their classroom for lunch. 
Again, principals would coordinate a schedule for staff to cover these lunch periods, and under either option, teachers would maintain their 30-minute duty-free lunch as required by our current master agreement. For virtual meal instruction, or for virtual meal, multiple meals will be available on Mondays and Wednesdays for pickup at all of our middle schools and high schools, in addition to a number of elementary schools and community sites. And lastly for this section, visitors to building, uh, to our building for various reasons. In order to visit a BCPS school under a hybrid model, visitors will have to make an appointment. The visits will be conducted remotely or outside wherever and whenever possible. If, however, if an indoor visit is required, visitors will be required to wear face coverings and abide by all social distancing practices of the time. So that does conclude um, a summary of our part two system and school operations. And I'll hand the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Boswell McComas, who will walk you through our instructional model. Dr. Boswell McComas. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, we are in a unique position as a community as we strive to create a new dual model of instruction in response to student and family needs during our global pandemic. And as board members, community and parent uh, members, you naturally want to understand how we will continue to evolve and move forward from a fully virtual model to create a very clear on-ramp to traditional in-person instruction that we all crave for our children because we do love them and we want results on their behalf. What we know is that our parents want and expect in-person instruction to be a very different experience for their children compared to virtual learning. We know that parents want the proven benefits that in-person teaching, teaching has proven over the years. And at the same time, we also know that when a student is experiencing virtual instruction, that our parents expect live teaching for, for them to continue as well and would not want to see that experience regress to where we started this journey last spring. Imagine for one moment, if you were a kindergarten teacher or a first grade teacher, how would you provide quality, direct live instruction when a small group or some of your students are in person with you in the classroom and the rest of your students are virtual for the day? What would be needed to make it work well, given all the student needs, given parent expectations, and given the health, safety, and logistical constraints of the pandemic? It is understand understandable that everyone wants reassurance that their children will not only be kept safe and healthy from infection, but they, they will also be able to have more in-person instruction. And I'm happy to share with you how we can provide another step towards in-person instruction that works in tandem with a virtual model as we continue to navigate the ever-changing pandemic conditions and effectively build an on-ramp to traditional schooling. To build this on-ramp to in-person instruction in this phase of reopening, we are planning a tandem model uh, that includes a hybrid option and a fully virtual option as illustrated on the screen and then as described by Dr. Roberts um, previously. The hybrid option provides a combination of in-person instruction paired with virtual instruction, while the fully virtual option is what people have been experiencing throughout this first quarter. Virtual instruction consists of a combination of live teacher instruction, often referred to as synchronous instruction, for a device paired with independent learning activities, often described as asynchronous. Our model here allows for the appropriate balance of both live in-person instruction as well as live teacher instruction through a device for students who are having a virtual day. In our model, teachers will teach in person to the cohort of students for that day, while the other cohort of students are experiencing virtual live instruction with special area teachers, along with completing independent learning assignments and where appropriate, an integrated whole group experience. The in-person cohort will have a two-hour early release schedule, at which point the teacher will provide live instruction for our students that are in the virtual format for the day. The in-person cohort students, once home, would resume independent learning assignments or asynchronous learning. So why this model? The key to ensuring and guaranteeing that quality live interaction for all of our youngest learners with our teachers rests with this early release schedule. It affords our students, regardless of which cohort, to have 
quality live interaction with their teachers, not sacrificing one group of students or cohort for another. And there are some additional value added aspects for our very youngest students, our preschoolers who are three years old, our pre-K students who are four, they will actually have more hours of in-person instruction compared to their normal half-day program as a function of logistics. It's important to clarify that our model that we're presenting here prioritizes live interactive teaching um, with our students. And it is not what many districts are doing as a concurrent model. In a concurrent model, our virtual students merely listen in and watch as the teacher in the classroom is really attending and engaging with students in front of them. We are proposing a model whereby our teachers are able to fully dedicate, engage, and support the students that they are in person with at one portion of the day, and then to give that same amount of dedication and engagement to our students who are in a virtual rotation for that day. We understand fully that our youngest learners, our preschoolers through our grade two students, developmentally require uh, a, the dedicated attention and engagement of their teachers to optimize their learning. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Ms. Byers so we can um, move forward and I know get to our question and answer section. Thank you for the opportunity to share this model. So thank you, Dr. Boswell McComas and Mr. Corns, if you could please go to the next slide. Thank you. The motion passed by the board on October 27th directed the superintendent um, to bring forward a plan that would bring students back on November 30th, 2020. The timeline that you see on this slide outlines the operational steps for implementation that would be necessary for a November 30th return. With the Thanksgiving break sitting in between this evening and November 30th, families and staff in elementary schools would receive the questionnaire referred to by Dr. Roberts on the same day that the plan would be released on our public website. Additionally, families and staff in our schools would have four business days to respond to the questionnaire. Once the data from the questionnaire is organized, staff in our schools and our Department of Transportation need to use that data in order to develop our bus routes, our stop times, our new bell schedules, and our new instructional schedules for all of our students in preschool through grade two. Additionally, we would wanna provide staff the opportunity to return five days prior to students. This would also leave staff with very little time to respond to the survey and then plan for their return. Um, finally, families would be notified of their new bell schedules, transportation routes and stops, and new instructional um, schedules the Wednesday before the holiday break if students were to return on the 30th. Next slide, please. As Dr. McComas said, we are ready and want to welcome our students back as soon as possible. But we know our current health metrics indicate that a return by November 30th is not recommended. As a result of those current health metrics, BCPS is poised to implement our plan in a manner that will have students in phase two re-entering school on December 14th. This would allow us time to monitor the metrics as well as launch the operational implementation steps that I just shared in a manner that allows staff, principals, transportation, and our families to plan accordingly. Of course, any return date for our staff and students, as mentioned multiple times tonight, is dependent on the health metrics of the time. Guidance reported by the governor and state agencies will continually be reviewed and monitored. And the Balt and Baltimore County Public Schools will continue to collaborate with the Baltimore County Health Department regarding our metrics in Baltimore County and the evolving nature of this pandemic. Next slide, please. So just in closing, we're gonna come back to this previous slide. According to our MSDE approved BCPS re-entry plan, 
BCPS would develop a hybrid approach that would prioritize bringing identified and targeted students back for in-person instruction. Again, as I previously mentioned, those targeted groups are identified by student needs and pedagogical strategies. Our phase and approach timeline of student groups identifies those small groups of students for reentry based on, and it will be based on our health metrics and our commitment to promoting the health, the welfare, and the safety of our students, staff, and families while maximizing student learning. And at this time, we are happy to take questions. So next slide, please. Thank you for that presentation. And uh, we already have hands up. And so, Ms. Rowe, if you are ready. Um, I did not have my hand up. Okay, so we're having a little technical issue. So, uh, Ms. Hen. I did not have my hand up. Ms. Causey, my hand's up. Mr. Q. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, I know we're limited on, on time and questions based on uh, the previous motion. So, um, We'll see what we can get through. There was a lot of information thrown at us um, in this, and unfortunately, um, it doesn't look like the the plan is available to everyone at this moment in time. Um, one of the questions and something that wasn't clear to me is the use of actual an actual um, indicator or questionnaire for every student before they come to school every day via uh, an app of some sort. Um, is there, does BCPS have this and are we planning on using this so that we have, um, so we're sure that we're keeping and allowing healthy kids in and making sure that folks are clear that their children have not been exposed and or have COVID? Mr. Kuhn, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Zarchin and Deb Somerville to respond to that question. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So the screening prior to the return of students is something that we have talked extensively about. Uh, with the screening, there are limitations to that. Um, what I'd like to do is have uh, Ms. Somerville share some of the uh, concerns with the screening and some of the promises uh, with that work. Ms. Somerville? Yes, thank you. We have looked into a variety of different screening methods and with the diversity of our community, um, have settled on using a questionnaire that will be mailed to families prior to their return to school and the families will understand the list of um, symptoms to screen the children for are on that form. They'll return that form with their child prior to the first day of school, and that screening form will be distributed to them um, at the beginning of each month subsequently. In addition, we have reinforcement um, materials that will be sent to each home, including a poster and a refrigerator magnet that stress the uh, screening criteria. Um, all are being prepared in multiple languages so that they will be accessible to all of our community. I'm sorry, Dr. Zarchin. Would you just give a quick introduction of Deb Somerville for the, for the board and the public? Absolutely. I apologize for that. So Ms. Somerville is our coordinator of health services. Uh, she works with Schools, school nurses is a liaison with the Department of Health. Um, it, she has done an incredible job uh, working for the with the planning and the response uh, with contact tracing. Um, she has done incredible work, but she is our coordinator of health services. Thank you. 
Okay, to follow up on that question, I, I, I have to um, just share my concern since I have children that actually play in various rec leagues and they're all using an app to provide that information to their coaches before any practice and or game. And I'm, and, and I just heard that you're mailing a paper form, uh, to families. And I'm concerned that if there is not continual daily screening of this sort, we're opening ourselves, even if it's not a hundred percent of the population due to, um, whatever issues, um, it, I think it's a mistake not to put those protocols in place um, because I think you're going to get the bulk uh, covered with a simple, a simple app that identifies, the, um, uh, you know, this for folks. Um, and I know I'm limited, but um, have – Yeah, I would just ask, do we have – the capability to do this because I can't believe that um, a rec league can do that and BCPS cannot do that. So the information that is mailed to families is part of that daily screening. Uh, one of the challenges with children, and I'll let uh, Ms. Somerville speak to this, is many times they don't show the symptoms that we as adults uh, exhibit with, with COVID. But the information mailed to parents is for daily screening. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. That's true. The um, daily screening is a component and is certainly recommended. Some of the challenges we face in public schools are that we pick our children up on the bus. And so it's just some of the logistics. It's a very different picture than a dropping a child off at a rec league, to be honest. Um, and with some of the um, discussions we had, not just in Baltimore County and with our health department, but with our um, other jurisdictions um, to, in terms of whether an app was appropriate, um, related to the fact that not all of our students have um, smartphones, our bus drivers would not be able to check, so then the students would get into school, and then what, just logistically, what do you do with social distancing and, and trying to check, and the manpower to check whether apps were completed that day when we've got the students down in the building. So we felt, and, and there is, um, I'm not aware of another public school system in Maryland that is using an app for screening So my two questions are over, so it's whoever's next. Thank you. Um, next is Ms. Mack and then Dr. Hager. Um, okay, thank you. I have two quick questions. Um, when, the, when students do return to school, considering it would be up until second grade, how will professionals like speech language pathologists, OTs, PTs, meet the needs of students who are in the school and students who are not in the school? Would they be expected to come to school to provide those services is my first question. And this is very granular, but I live very close to a BCPS bus stop where there's about 10 kids who normally get picked up. Given the limitations of the bus, if the bus pulls up to that stop and can only seat six of those 10 children, what happens to the other four children? And how is that type of constraint going to be communicated to parents? Thank you. So, Ms. Mack, thank you for your questions. I will get us started by um, addressing your question about service providers and teachers who may provide instruction across, excuse me, buildings. At, in the end, once our families complete the questionnaire and we have more uh, specific data, we will be working through schedules uh, along with that cohorting model. With that, we will certainly have to look at all the services that are provided and work through a, a schedule. There will be instances, and I'll, I'll use ESOL as an example, uh, if you don't mind. So our ESOL teachers at the elementary levels typically work across multiple buildings. And of course, we certainly wouldn't want them to be moving from building to building in a single day because of health reasons. The service will have to be provided in a blended model, meaning that when and to the extent possible, we want to provide in-person service. 
but there it will need to be complemented with virtual um, service as well on a rotation, for example, to make sure that uh, we are um, not inadvertently cross-contaminating uh, communities and cohorts. So the, the specific nuances of that will have to be worked out at each school with each set of faculty and service providers, but that is the, um, the broad answer for you. Um, I will attempt to answer the transportation one, and certainly any of my colleagues can help clarify if, if I am inaccurate. Part of our uh, information gathering in our questionnaire, as Dr. Roberts indicated, is families will have to let us know if they need transportation. So, And so our transportation office um, works diligently all the time, and they certainly will be monitoring the number of students that need to be picked up at, at different locations. And I don't know, That's, I guess what I'm saying, Ms. Mack, is our transportation will have a sense of how many children at a particular stop need to be picked up. Um, and so our goal is never to just you know, leave children. <laughs> well, and that's my concern. Right. I didn't want yeah. parents to think their kids were getting on the bus and four of them didn't. Yes, ma'am, right. And and nor would we, especially, I mean, for any student, but especially for our very youngest uh, children. So again, I don't know if any of our colleagues has anything more to add yeah, or clarify. Dr. Okay. McComas, uh, Mr. Patillo and his team are on the line. So uh, Mr. Patillo or Dr. Graham, if you wanted to add, any additional insight for, for Mr. West? Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Jess Grimm. Uh, what Dr. McComas said is correct. Um, we will ensure that the uh, we are properly identifying bus stops and that we won't have overcapacity based on uh, current guidelines. Okay, thank you, Mr. Grimm. Thank you, Dr. McComas and Dr. Scriven. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hi, I just have one quick question for everyone and I apologize if you said it and I missed it, but um, the health metrics that are outlined in the flowchart of the actual report that's been published on page three, I think are very nice and, and very well described. Um, and we all know that in Maryland, there are lots of different numbers that get floated around uh, between the state numbers and the Hopkins numbers. Now, I guess they're the same. And so anyway, there are lots of different sources. So I was just wondering if you're planning to, to kind of publish some sort of a thermometer or something on the, on the BCPS website that parents could go to to see kind of where we fall at this moment in time regarding the, met the health metrics for reopening um, so that we can all track it and see how close we are to a point where we can eventually reopen. Thank you for that question. Uh, we do have, Friday we started our first update, uh, which was posted on the web page, and we are working on a dashboard for the COVID metrics that we hope to have ready Friday. Uh, that'll be the first day with the dashboard. Uh, we've been working really hard, so it's easy to understand. Uh, folks can go right to that dashboard and get a sense of where we are and how we're trending with the metrics. Great, that's all I wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Offerman. Uh, yes, I, I would ask I would ask staff to just one more time go over what a teachers they will be like in this uh, in this mixed hybrid and uh, and in person environment. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure, Mr. Offerman. Um, and so I will, um, if you will, imagine that uh, Mary McComas is first grade teacher. And I would start my day off with my students that are coming in person for the cohort that day. Let's say, for example, it's Monday. And today I'm servicing the um, 10 to 12 students or the number of students that are signed up for cohort A. I would start my day um, most likely with our children having universal breakfast for the ones that are in person. My students that are having a virtual day would log in and prepare for their um, independent assignments. Uh, then I may have a class meeting. A class meeting would be a good opportunity for me to have an integrated moment with both the students in person and my students who are virtual for that day. Um, class meetings typically at the elementary level, you know, can run uh, about 15 minutes or so where we do our morning message and we, and we uh, set purpose for our learning for the day. Then I would move into providing a teaching in a traditional um, in-person fashion with my students who are there with me, while my students who are virtual for the day 
um, maybe working on some asynchronous assignments. And then when I'm teaching, for example, imagine if I'm teaching English language arts, I may do a read out loud um, activity. That would be another moment in time where I could have an integration, right? Where my students that are virtual um, and my students in person, I could be doing the read aloud because that's really a teacher modeling activity uh, where I'm, I'm reading and I'm demonstrating my thinking and my processing. Um, and again, while I'm providing small group instruction with the children in front of me, my virtual students would then be working independently on their asynchronous assignment. Then we could move later into the day where the students are working with their special area teachers. Um, that may afford me a planning opportunity. Um, um, and then as we move later in the day, for example, we would move into our math block. Again, math block is a time where I would be providing traditional in-person instruction for those students who are with me for the day while my uh, virtual students, again, may be working through independent assignments. Then students would reach a, a lunch time, um, and then our students would move into a, a content. It's the elementary, and uh, Mr. Offerman, I know we're secondary folks, they call it content, but it's really like science or social studies or health, depending upon what the rotation is. Um, and then as we move into the students that would be with me in person that day would move into dismissal time. Then as those students are traveling home and then beginning their independent work time, I will then be able to um, provide my full attention to my students who are virtual, just as, as I'm doing right now with all of our board members and trying to make sure that I'm paying attention to you, that I'm answering your questions, that I'm demonstrating and, and really giving you the attention uh, that I was able to provide those morning students in person. I hope, Mr. Offerman, that I clarified for you what that experience would be like on both sides of the corn coin to the best of my ability um, without uh, kind of showing you a chart of how that, that lays out. Thank you. I have one other comment, and that is uh, I feel like that the time frame between the approval plan and, uh, and actually setting up uh, starting school in person is is just too short. I, I think too much is packed in. Uh, if everything goes perfectly, it, it certainly is reasonable, but we all know that things don't always go perfectly. And in order to do the right job, I think I think we need to consider adding time between the approval plan and any, and the actual opening. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Ackman. The board members for the next board member ask questions. I did just want to let board members and our stakeholders know that the PowerPoint that was shown is going to be attached to board docs. And also there are two documents that were uh, prepared for the board uh, in what's executive content for us to see. And those will also be attached to board docs for the public um, to review. And Ms. Rowe, I see that your hand is up. Yes, hi. Um, so I have two questions. My first question is, how long do the metrics have to be um, acceptable before we go back to school? And once we're in school, how long do the metrics have to be unacceptable before we send kids back home and go do just virtual? Thank you for that question. So. In our work with Dr. Branch and Dr. Chen in the Department of Health, they have advised that we have, once we have an acceptable metric uh, for the state and Department of Health, uh, that we wait two weeks before we return. And that's two weeks without a spike uh, out of the acceptable level. As far as going out, a decision would be made once the metrics reach a point uh, that are not uh, acceptable. We use that score, but also the state metrics uh, are an important part of that as well. So we would look at the positivity rate and the cases per 100,000. Both are seven day averages, so it's not like it would spike up in one day and all of a sudden we're out. Uh, the averages we look at are seven and 14 day averages. So it, it keeps us from having to quickly respond to one day that may be a high score uh, 
that would raise concerns that really may not be the concern that we would see over seven or 14 days. So will we be able to see on the dashboard if it looks like we're headed towards a school closing? Yes, every Friday that dashboard, uh, the data will be posted. So it, it will be evident uh, which way we're trending through that data. Okay, and Ms. McComas, Dr. McComas, um, my okay. second question is for you. So in listening to your explanation to Mr. Offerman, I have a question I would like to know. It seems like the when you have hybrid cohorts A and B, and then you have cohort C. And it sounded to me like you were saying that the students who are on virtual, on the have virtual days when they're part of hybrid, that those students, their virtual days are independent study unless they're also viewing what's going on in the classroom. But so the cohort C, is their virtual day look different than the hybrid virtual day? No, that's a great question, Ms. Rowe. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to clarify um, understanding for everyone. So the students that are virtual, rather you're a hybrid student who's having a virtual day or a student who is virtual every day, their work um, and the flow of their day will be the same. Um, the, the difference will be that, um, let's say you're in cohort B, you have virtual on Monday and Tuesday and in person Thursday and Friday. Their whole day is not just um, virtual or independent work. It really will ebb and flow in and out. And so they will start, they will have uh, the bulk of their independent work time during the morning when the teacher is also with the students that are in person. However, the nature of instruction allows us opportunities throughout the day to actually bring the whole group together. What we really need to think about is, um, you know, our, our students that are having a virtual day, rather that's every day or just uh, three of the five days a week, they essentially become a form of small group. And so the way teachers work um, naturally, whether they're in person or virtually, is that you have your whole group instructional opportunities, and then you have your breakout groups where you're doing specific skill and work. Um, and as a teacher, some of those, as you're familiar with, you know, some of those small group sessions are independent practice opportunities where students are working on skills that you've provided them direct instruction and coaching on in small group or whole group. Um, and so it really ebbs and flows. Another area where um, students would not that are having a virtual day would not be just independently on their own all day would be the special area uh, teaching. So again, when they rotate to their specials, that would be time during the day uh, where our virtual students would have live instruction. It would just be with the special area. I hope I clarified. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> it's difficult without um, kind of a visual. Board members, um, there's a technical issue with hands staying up and hands <clears throat> not being raised when people have said that they would like to speak. So here's a board member that uh, has not yet spoken and would like to speak. Um, please go ahead and start. Okay, so not hearing from anyone. Um, I did want to, uh, I had a question. So if uh, staff could bring back the slide with the timeline from decision-making to students walking into the classroom.
Thank you. So I have um, a couple things to say. One is what looks like it's needed is what has been referred to by um, other board members is a countdown to implementation. We know what the metrics uh, calculations are. That's very well documented, very well outlined. So if students and parents have made decisions in advance that they are going to be cohort A or that they are going to be in an in-person cohort versus a, a cohort C, then the timeline really of getting the thumbs up goes to 11-19. And if staff could explain from there what is the optimal time when the cohorts are already known and the metrics say yes, what is the timeline to bring students back in person? So good so evening, I, Ms. Pazzi. This is Dr. Phillip. I can just share from the survey, based on the timeline that's shared here, this was developed to meet the expectations set by the board where students would return by November 30th. So looking at the timeline that's listed here, um, we would have students back, we would have students participating in those options um, on November 30th because that was the deadline set by the board. Ms. Byers, I'm not sure if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, so thank, thank you, Dr. Wheatley Phillip. Um, I will um, add, and then of course, any of my colleagues um, can add on if I've missed something. So again, to Dr. Wheatley Phillip's point, we were just really more showing you the, in this timeline, knowing um, what our metrics are currently, what the operational steps would be. Um, what we, no, we would want is to afford our families the opportunity to read and digest the plan prior to making a decision regarding um, selecting to do a hybrid approach or remaining virtually. Um, we know we want our families to be able to make an informed choice. Similarly, we would want our staff, our, our teachers and all of our staff, our paras, um, our additional assistants, we would want them to have the same opportunity. Um, in terms of once the data, once the questionnaire closes and we have the data that we need um, regarding staff intent and family intent, um, that's where the work really begins because that's the data we're able to act on. It actually goes back to Ms. Mack's question about how do we make sure we don't have a student at a bus stop who can't get on a bus? Um, well, we need the data to be able to plan that. And so we would need to take that information. And there's several things that need to happen with the information from the questionnaire. Um, some are operational and some are instructional. So I'm going to divide them into those two categories. From an operational standpoint, uh, Dr. Grimm and team need to be able to cohort the students. Again, as Dr. Robert explained, um, addresses come into play there because we would want to cohort siblings um, on the same day in the same cohort. Uh, we have to look at bus stops, bus times. So there's the typical operations around transportation with the added layer of making sure that our Department of Transportation is adhering to all of those mitigation strategies that we mentioned. On the instructional side, once our uh, school staff, our building leaders, our principals, our system principals, and our leadership teams at schools have the data regarding which students um, are opting for an in-person instruction, they begin the work of looking at their bell times, seeing if modifications need to be made to bell times based on transportation, um, looking at their overall instructional schedules um, to ensure that cohorts are balanced. Um, they will make every attempt possible to not have to uh, switch a student's teacher or a student's class. Our teachers have worked so hard to build really good relationships with our students in this virtual environment. So they'll wanna make sure cohorts are balanced, um, that they develop school-based schedules. And then at the same time, they're also developing to Dr. to the way Dr. McComas was explaining earlier, those schedules that um, will be applicable to students when they are in a virtual setting, be that 
they're a virtual day in the hybrid model or they have opted into a full virtual model. So that is the work that has to be done. Um, in this timeline that we put together, we only allowed three business days for that because we were given the November 30th deadline with the Thanksgiving holiday in the middle. Um, but again, to afford proper planning, um, I just wanted to give you all of the considerations that would be part of that planning. And then the final step is the communication. Um, we need to be able to share with families the plan. Um, as a parent, parents wanna know what does my student's daily schedule look like? If I do need transportation, what is my bus stop? What is my bus time? And then once I have that information, um, do I have enough time to plan accordingly around potential daycare and my own work schedule? So those are all of the things that would, would be considered. As I mentioned, um, as we are monitoring the metrics and when you um, bring together all of those steps I just mentioned with what Dr. Zarchin said about uh, metrics needing to stabilize for 14 days, um, I had shared that we would be poised to have students in seats once the, you know, if all, if all goes well, if all goes great and the metrics go in the right direction, we would be poised to have students back in, in seats uh, to return on December 14th for phase two. I hope that answered your question. And please, any of my colleagues can jump in if I miss something. I would just like to add the, um, I'm sorry, I was a moment. I just would like to add the importance of getting that transportation right for our very youngest students. That, that was just a, a critical thing to think about, I asked for us to consider. Thank you. Thank you. So that was um, all very good information, but I, I think you misunderstood my first question, which is from the time that the, and, and what the plan, <clears throat> here's where I think there's a disconnect. What the plan needs to be is how do we implement when the metrics are right? Not waiting till the metrics come and then do the planning. So, 30 seconds. So my, so my first question is still, is the recommendation for how long the planning takes? Can that to be done ahead of time and then the metrics will guide the implementation? So Ms. Causey, um, one of the things I was thinking about as Mrs. Byers was, was providing an answer was what I'm hearing your question as, I look at it from the data being as fresh as possible, meaning as close to when the implementation would occur. So if I heard you draw that line between questionnaire closes and staff returning, if the survey, if the questionnaire, I apologize, was issued, let's say, based on this timeline, to get your point to be ready to pounce, right? To be ready to jump when that when that two week window closes of good metrics. If if that window extends based on everything we're hearing into weeks into late November into early December, then I think as a as a parent in our families, they may have provided a response to the survey two or three or four weeks earlier. And then based on whatever the circumstances within their family may have wanted to change their mind. But because of all the planning that Mrs. Byers explained, we would have to move forward with the questionnaire results from whenever the questionnaire was given. So part of the timeline development was keeping the questionnaire results as close and or as fresh as possible to the implementation so our parents had um, the optimum opportunity to, to make the best decision for their children. And, and I don't know if that answers your question, but that's at least how I, how I heard your, your question. In the interest of time, I'll just um, appreciate the information that you gave us. It also sounds like um, planning really needs to start for the second semester. If we want to be able to have the second semester to be ready for in-person instruction when the metrics allow, was there consideration given to... <laughs> Thank you, I'll finish up. Having teachers that want to teach virtually teach the cohorts of students who want to teach virtually 
which will reduce the class size of those teachers that are teaching the dual method. Has that been considered? So Ms. Calsey, let me just jump in. I think the important part is what we've learned from the work with the four public separate day schools. It, it's around the school scheduling and planning and getting the information from the parents to work out the logistics. Um, as, as it was reported, we're still working with our staff, our union, and so we, we want to look at bringing back, when it's safe to do so, a group of kids uh, before the start of second semester. But we have to know the particular students so we can plan, and that was some of the feedback when we were looking at phase one um, wow. and uh, bringing back students from our separate day schools. So it's, the work is in the details, and the details would be who, who, who's doing virtual and who, who wants in person to then develop those schedules. And it, that's the time. And that's the time that the team was describing to do it well. Um, but we need that information to do it. We have set up in terms of um, positioning the schools when we were dealing with the four public day schools and making sure they have the PPEs, the signage, et cetera. That can be done as, we, as we're developing these schedules. But I think the important part is our learning from phase one um, and what we need to do with phase two. And it's all about developing those schedules as the team described, not only the instructional piece, but the operational piece in terms of transportation, the meals, et cetera. So it, at least at least two weeks and so, but right now, based on the metrics, where we are at this point, and I believe it was Mr. Arferman saying, you know, the, the time is short. We do need extended time. And then if you're looking at what's here on the screen, what the health department is concerned about whenever there are holidays that are happening. So in the midst of this is the Thanksgiving break. And there are some concerns about the potential of large groups gathering and, and an impact that will have on our metrics as a county. So all of those things are taking in consideration as we look at the implementation timeline. And to Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I had a second question following Kathleen's comment. Um, so the, the board pushed the school system to come up with a plan and we knew it would be an ambitious plan because it was going to be a quick turnaround but we felt that we had to push for a plan because there wasn't a detailed plan like this available and so first of all I thank you for the plan but I also am worried that this implementation timeline is getting really hung up on this survey and I get that if you asked me today if I would send my kids back I'd say it depends on the metrics which we all we all feel that way but I think we can make a plan that would assume 10%, 20%, 50, you know, 40, we can make a plan that's based on different percentages of kids coming back and then instead spend our time um, in parallel having the parents read and digest the plan, like Ms. Byer said, vetting the plan with stakeholders, making sure everyone's on board, making sure the buildings are in the right state for reopening instead of getting hung up on the exact number of kids who are going to ride the bus and the exact number of kids who are going to be in a classroom. So I'm just worried that we're going to like hurry up and wait instead of moving forward with this plan because I think it's going to be months before we're at the point with our COVID numbers where we're really ready to reopen. But that doesn't mean we can't be ready when when we're when the when the numbers are there. So that I guess is my my uh, my big concern is is there a different way to approach this timeline so that we're not getting too hung up on parent surveys and instead moving forward with actually getting the buildings prepared and the stakeholders involved. Well, yes, um, we did say, as you heard the team say, that um, this was the ask, but we were also looking at um, a different time, which Ms. Byers did say around December 14th. So, so we can continue to work. I just want to remind the board, back in July, you supported the recommendation about a semester of virtual learning. And then, of course, there were announcements that were made shortly afterwards. And so to your point, Dr. Hager, we can look at all the nuances of, of having some groups coming back. Our recommendation is to look at 
after D November 30th, as the, Ms. Byers did say, that we can look at the details and we can have things kind of um, in the queue, ready to go. Um, and then once we know um, the number of, 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 of students, as well as our staff, uh, I think we can move forward. We're, we're not saying we're not saying we're, we we won't do what's necessary to position ourselves for bringing back small groups. We're just saying, based on this timeline, as as it was requested, we we feel we have to amend this timeline and look at something else based on what was reported earlier today. So I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Other board members? So I would like to make a motion if uh, staff can first put the slide back on uh, the phase in approach for student groups. Thank you. So I want to make a motion that when the metrics are positive for in-person instruction and all of the other work has been done as pointed out by um, all of the staff tonight, that phase one and phase two and phase three would all start at the same time. Is there a second? Second, Kuhn. Thank you. And I just wanted to speak to my motion. Can um, you restate your motion? Thank you. Yes. So in <clears throat> my motion is that the plan is updated so that when the metrics are correct and all of the operational work has been done, that phase one, phase two, and phase three all start at the same time with So to speak to my motion, um, the point of it is that uh, we have seen um, the phase one public separate day schools um, that, you know, it, there was quite a time in getting that plan up and then <clears throat> our window closed. And just something similar may happen whenever it is that the students come back to in-person um, where the, the metrics are good and if the phasing in takes too long, student groups may miss two, four, or six weeks of that amazing in-person instruction that is really going to help our children recover from um, the losses that they've had. So that's that's my motion. Board members, are there questions? Ms. Causey, um, yes. I, I just want to bring to the board attention when we meet with the health department and we meet with the COVID task force, the description of a phase in model um, based on smaller groups coming back um, was, was recommended, hence why we have done this phase in approach. Uh, I just want to bring to your attention that, you know, the concern has always been about large groups uh, of students returning. Granted, we still have to uh, look at the phase one of our public separate day schools, but phase two and phase three, um, I, I just question about um, just, just pulling those two together when the metrics are good. We're, we're looking at, of course, looking at these grades, there are multiple grades 
um, and, and potential larger students, larger groups of students. And so it wasn't recommend that we, d we start off like that with a robust approach, but to bring in a much more smaller group of students, hence why we landed on this phase and approach. This is from the, the collaboration with our health department. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask, is that uh, in the MSDE guidelines? Again, it's the conversation that we have had with the Baltimore County Health Department representatives and our approach of looking at a phase in model, then having all three groups coming in as outlined here at, a, at the same time. Just want to raise that concern. Okay, I have one more question left on the motion and I'll reserve that. Other board members? I uh, see Ms. Joes. Uh, my Thank hand you. was up before Ms. Joes. I'm sorry, but my hand was up before Ms. Joes. Ms. Pasture, if Ms. Joes yields, that's fine. There's she doesn't have to. Eat. My hand was up before her hand was up. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. But there are times when uh, texts are popping up in the chat that cover up information. Uh, so I uh, just would ask everyone's patience as we deal with the technology and uh, trying to process every board member having an opportunity. So, Ms. Pasture, go right ahead. Thank you. All right, for clarity, Dr. Williams, phase one is the um, consists of the public um, separate day schools. So we know right now that's delayed. So you are talking about using the metrics um, still through the health department, et cetera, in terms of opening phase one. And then from the point at which that opens, then you will take a look for the second phase. Is that what you just said? Is that what you're saying in essence? Yes, that was recommended. And I, and I don't know if Dr. Zarchin or, or Ms. Somerville is on, are still on the line, but based on the conversation, it was, it was advised to do much more of a phase in approach. So yes, that's, that's what we were looking at versus having all of the three groups come in together as as the as Ms. Causey made her motion. Well my question is about it does it begin with whichever date the phase one happens? Not that they all come together. Let's say phase one doesn't start until let's say it starts November 30th. So then two would come after a period of seeing how that works and then after seeing how, et cetera. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes, Thank you. yes. All right. Thank you, Ms. Causey and Ms. Jose. Ms. Jose? Thank you. Dr. Williams, I think you answered some of my questions. So one of my concerns with bringing all faces together is that um, the simple phase approach means having it staggered and it would be easier for us to monitor how a small group does via the data dashboard that Dr. Zirkin was talking about. And even just a simple mathematical model, I'm not an epidemiologist by any means, but uh, the more people that are in the building, the faster it will spread. And if we could monitor that for two weeks and then bring in the next phase, uh, that I think is the whole idea between phasing it and, and you explained it. So I, I don't think I'm comfortable with bringing everybody in uh, at the same time. There's more people and it'll spread faster if it does go south pretty quickly on us. So, thank you. Other board members discussion? Ms. Causey, uh, this is Russ Kuhn. Yes, Mr. Kuhn. Just so that we're clear about the numbers we're talking about, how many children are in phase three? The, this, from, from my understanding, it says outside general education grades three through 12. And I'm, I'm guessing those are special education or folks with IEPs or and, and select CET classes. Is, is that accurate? I have no idea 
how many children we're talking about. So I wouldn't be able to give you that exact number right now, Mr. Kuhn, um, but to help clarify that a little bit, because I hear the question you're asking, so thank you. Um, it includes students who are typically served in a classroom environment where 50% of or more of the students receive special education services. That's how you define outside of general education. And so in many of our schools, um, we have programs that service students um, whose least restrictive environment is outside general education student um, excuse me, outside general education setting. And those students would attend that school um, because it is their, their home school. We use that expression. They are within their attendance um, in catchment area. Then we also have programs that service students um, who's in that least restrictive environment um, in a regional model. So um, you've probably heard, uh, you know, we have social emotional learning support programs. We have communication and learning support programs. So those programs exist in schools, both for students who attend that school, but then also we have a model um, that is cross boundary in a regional model. So I hope that just clarifies the programs that we would be looking at in addition to, yes, those select CTE programs. Um, and again, that would be programs where the pedagogical strategy is hands-on when we look at um, what may be required for credentialing. And Dr. Boswell McComas, if, I, if you wanna add anything to that, please feel free to jump in. I, I would just like to add, first off, uh, excellent job. Thank you for the support, uh, Ms. Byers. Um, Mr. Kuhn, I would just like to add that, you know, or actually really for all of our members here in the public, um, that the phase-in model is a very thoughtful approach, and it's thoughtful in a number of ways. It's thoughtful in addressing the specific um, and, and most important needs of our students, um, and along with uh, thoughtful in allowing us to layer in the logistics. Uh, to make sure that we're able to coordinate uh, instructional schedules, that we're able to coordinate the transportation, um, while of course following all the health and safety guidelines. We fully acknowledge that as conditions change for the better and, and, and things improve, it certainly will help us um, have an accordion effect to our ability to move faster, um, just as right now the conditions have uh, required us to slow down a bit. Um, and so uh, just Circling back to Mr. Kuhn's specific question, as Ms. Byer said, um, our students that receive specialized uh, programs outside of general education section um, session of class um, is a specific number of, of students. I do not have that number just at the tip of my fingertips this evening, um, but that there are students who are eligible for that uh, service through their IEP process. And again, the CTE is uh, specifically select programs in which students need access to um, hands-on equipment to get a certain number of hours to meet their credentialing requirement for their professional professional. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I just want to follow on to that answer because it brings up a good point. When I look at this this um, in front of us and I'm and I believe you're talking two weeks for each milestone here. Um, and I understand staggering it and the value of doing that. But my concern is that that's a month and a half of time that we're losing for all of the, the, the other kids um, in phase four. And that is a significant number of kids that are just, you know, for another month and a half sitting in front of their screens. And, you know, I, I understand the numbers and the trends that are occurring now. Uh, I think what you're hearing is, in essence, um, uh, the fact that everybody and the parents have been especially clear about this. They need to see a detailed plan as to what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Uh, so, you know, my, my other concern, and I guess my question is, the, the public separate day schools, I know that we're not going live with that, um, and I'm very happy about that, to be honest with you. I didn't think we'd get past this meeting, but it is already canceled. But 
you all were collecting data, and I don't know if that was shared, but do we even know how many parents were going to send their children to school on the schedule that you had initially announced? I believe you all collected that data, and I don't, I don't have, I don't have that data. So yes, our, our principals. Oh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Roberts. Sorry. Yeah, so, Ms. Green, yes, we do. Our principals, as we shared, I think it was uh, the last board meeting. Our principals, <clears throat> because of the size of those schools, were able to reach out. Um, specifically and independently to those parents. So on average, and because I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but on average, we're looking at about to a quarter to a, to at most a third, um, depending on the four schools, that would be those parents indicated when those conversations were had, um, who indicated that their children would participate in a hybrid environment. I would um, also just like to say, Mr. Kuhn, that I do, I just want to communicate that I do understand the intent is to reopen schools with all due haste uh, once conditions are safe and we can move um, appropriately. Thank you. So who was next? Okay, so I think Dr. Hager had a question. I'm sorry. She had, she had mentioned in the chat she had a question. I don't know if she's on mute. Dr. Hager? Uh, yes, I'm here. I just wanted to speak to the, to the motion that you made, Ms. Causey. I um, and also make a comment about something that was said earlier. Dr. Williams mentioned that we did we had voted for a virtual first semester, which is absolutely true. Um, but it was with the caveat that we were under the impression that if the metrics were in place, that this sort of a phased in plan would happen over the first semester. And again, with stakeholder input and with, with um, a plan in place. And so, um, although I agree that what you know the the first semester was was a possibility, it was never I think um, anyone's intention for it to wait, be a whole first semester. And so I share Ms. Causey's concern that, um, and, this, and Mr. Kuhn's concern that it, over time, it's, this is going to just delay things and delay things and delay things. Having said that, from a public health perspective, I do think a phased in approach is the right approach. And so I actually will not vote for the motion, but I do think that I, I, sh I share those concerns that we, it, it's just taking a longer time than expected. And so I just wanted to make that comment about the motion. Thank you. Other board members? I just want to, um, Dr. McComas, do you want to share what you just typed in about the number of students in outside general education? Yeah, so my team was able to uh, quickly uh, pull uh, the outside general education uh, group that we're speaking of in phase three is approximately 1,500 students. Uh, that does not include the uh, obviously the CTE um, number, so it's it's not an insignificant number of students. I'm sorry, did you say insignificant, well, not insignificant, insignificant? Yes, I'm saying it's it's not a small group. I mean, a thousand five hundred students to me is a sizable group across the system um, in their location. You know, assigned to their different uh, locations. Thank you. Okay, any other board members before we have a roll call vote? Ms. Gover? I Please I repeat the motion. Ms. Pasture? Please repeat the motion. Yes. Trace, did you record that or would you like me to state it? Uh, you moved that when the metrics are positive for in-person instruction and after all of the work has been done, that phase one, phase two, and phase three would all start at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. We can now have the roll call vote. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Mahomza? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. 
Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Uh, Causey? Yes. Favor so of the motion. You. Thank you. So the motion fails. Board members, other questions or discussion? Hearing none, I want to make a, a another motion that the um, <clears throat> that the superintendent and his team bring a plan to the board for a hybrid semester, the second semester in. Um, Uh, before winter break. Excuse me. <clears throat> I withdraw that. I'm going to make a motion that the superintendent and his team bring a detailed plan for having a hybrid second semester by the second meeting in December. Is there a second? Second, Kuhn. Thank you. And I want to um, speak to my motion, which is I'm not discounting um, the continued efforts to try to implement phased in learning for students this semester. That's not what my motion is about. My motion is about understanding all of the planning that's been talked about um, but also understanding the um, needs of our students to have the best education that they can. And we know that the disparities are growing um, amongst many groups, uh, that all of this planning does get done in a time frame so that parents can digest it, the board can digest it, and then the uh, operational issues can be implemented. So, discussion? Ms. Causey. This yes. Is Mr. I, I do have a question. I, I, I think that there's confusion um, because everybody is expecting a, a detailed plan. Um, my only question is, have we not set a date for that detailed plan? So, I supported your motion just to start to have the conversation, but my expectation is, as I, I believe Ms. Rowe mentioned in the, um, the chat, that isn't isn't there isn't the plan to have a plan before that time? We can have. The expectation is we we will have a detailed plan regardless of what the metrics are, based on uh, the the current um, focus on on the January 29th start for second semester. So the point of setting the date for having the plan coming to the board is so that it can be considered, that it can be uh, vetted, and that it can be then implemented when the metrics are correct. What we have uh, seen and understand with the incredible work that is required, um, that it takes time. So I am just suggesting that in order to make sure that the second semester is prepared um, for students and staff and parents and all the logistics, that we really need to see that plan by the second meeting in December. Because given the timeline and that, that slide is in there, that we need those number of weeks in January. And again, students will return when the metrics are correct. So having a plan is in order to be prepared when the metrics are correct. And again, I'm not precluding a phase in approach for small groups of students this semester, um, but I'm just, I'm just thinking ahead. Uh, board members, is there other questions 
or comments? Dr. Williams, can you can you please clarify oh, yeah, yeah. as to when you would be providing a plan uh, without this motion and what the expectation is for, for you? So the, well, let me say what's posted on the website that was approved by MSDE was a second semester plan. So, So what you're saying is the plan that's on the website is detailed enough to execute um, in January? So you're asking for the details, the operation, like we put, like we shared about how many buses, the class schedule, um, the information from the staff. So that's in the operations. But in terms of what you just asked, the plan that was approved is on the website for second semester hybrid. So if that's the case, then this motion is already fulfilled because there's already a plan on the, we on the website, um, Ms. Causey. So I, I don't quite understand. And so if you, if, Russ, if you're asking me a question, um, the, the, what we have seen in, in the recent meetings with these plans um, is much more detailed than what's in the reopening plan that was posted in August, that was approved in August and posted in August. So for instance, second semester, uh, we heard from Dr. McComas about instructional models. Um, I asked the question earlier, has it been considered that teachers that want to teach virtually can have students that want to be taught virtually, thereby uh, limiting the number of students that other teachers will have to teach in a dual method? So apparently that hasn't been considered. So maybe that could be considered and that could help with logistics to make it as effective as possible. Um, even in terms of um, the number of students, we don't know what the totality of students, not talking yet about the parent survey, that are in um, some of these other groups, phase two all students. So we've had board members that have uh, legitimate concerns about the number of students that would be in buildings at the same time, um, on buses, uh, maybe one after the other and so forth. And so those concerns and logistics can be addressed with a specific plan. I'm sorry, point of order. Um, we've heard both from Ms. Causey and Mr. Coombe twice. So I think there are other board members who would like the opportunity. Um, we said we were going to stick to two minutes per member per two questions. Certainly. Sorry, so other like board members, other board members. I have a question if it's my turn. Yes, please go ahead. So as I understand the situation, the metrics determine when we start to execute this plan, but it's, we would start with hybrid voluntary entry. And then if that goes well, then the phases start. So um, I don't understand, I don't understand this motion. So I would ask Dr. Williams to have staff address your question. So um, at this point, I responded to what I thought was the earlier question. I don't know what more staff can can respond to other than the operations of what will be taking place second semester. Um, as as I shared earlier, um, if we're going to we can get into the operations about the number of kids, the schedules, transportation, but, but the second semester plan was what was approved and what's, what's on our website. I don't know, if sta I don't think there's anything that staff can respond to um, in addition to what I'm sharing right now. 
Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, yes, I just want to say that I um, I read and reread the reopening plan that was you know developed by the school system in August and then approved in September, and I think it's really good for August. And um, August was what three months ago, which is like two years in COVID times, and so there have been a lot of things that have changed since that that plan was prepared. And I think what we heard tonight was really good, and I think, think it was very thoughtful, and the whole operational side of how we'll actually execute this plan is was really, really good to hear. And so I appreciate that there was a motion last meeting that led us to get to this point where, where we and the rest of the county could hear about what the plan looks like. And so I actually would support this motion because I, I think having you know, everybody works better with a deadline and having a deadline to really articulate what those um, those specific plans are for when we reopen, I think would be really helpful for parents and teachers and students and, and everyone involved. So, 30 seconds. Miss um, Mack? Um, yes, I actually, I have a question and a comment. Um, I, well, actually two comments. I think it would be helpful if staff for each one of these points um, provided the number of students involved and for phase one, could we provide the number of students and then the information that we received from the surveys about how many of those students had planned to come back knowing that that could change. But if we could look at the number of students in phase two, we know the outside general education numbers for phase three, but we don't know the CTE numbers. I think that would be helpful. And the other thing that I would like to suggest potentially that Dr. Williams and his staff look at is flipping phase two and phase one. We received a tremendous number of, uh, of emails and a lot of feedback about the fact that our public day school students are our most vulnerable students. And I, I think given the fact that we're going to rework the plan anyway, and I do support this motion, I'd like to see a new plan that moves the public day schools to the, the second phase, if that's possible. So was there a question in that, Ms. Max? No, just comments. Okay, thank you. Other board members before we vote? Okay, hearing nothing further. Ms. Gober, can you do a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Hume? Yes. Ms. Pester? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Could you tally that for me, please? Eight in favor? Thank you. The motion carries. Okay, board members, uh, Dr. Williams was there. Um, any guidance from the board that you were seeking at this point? No, ma'am. Thank you. So thank you so much to everyone for all of that good information. I know that we are all working together from the same perspective of trying to do the best that we can for our students. This is Causey, this is Rod McMillian. I'd like to say something. Certainly, Mr. McMillian. I think Ms. Mack had an excellent idea on flip-flopping the public separate day schools with the second group. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. And I and given her comments and the other perspectives, I, I would agree with that as well. Okay, so we are going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item K on business proposed 2021 2022 school calendar. And for that we call on Mr. Duke. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. 
On September 29th, two calendar options for the 21-22 school year were presented to the board for consideration. Second reading and pub public comment took place on October 13th, 2020. This evening, I am respectfully requesting the board's consideration and adoption of a calendar for the 21-22 school year. Before the board discusses and votes on the calendar options, I would request the board's indulgence and allow me to recommend that an edit be made to the calendar entries for November the 5th, January the 21st, and April the 1st. These are the days at the end of each quarter when elementary and middle schools are released early to allow teachers to work on grading and data analysis. The entries should be amended to read grade recording instead of grade reporting. This edit will make the entries consistent with the respective footnote at the bottom of the calendar. Thank you. Thank you for that. And hearing no objections, the board will um, accept those corrections. So, uh, board members, I wanted to um, make a motion, which is that whatever calendar is selected, that the professional development days that are allotted on this calendar, as well as future calendars, will not be considered as inclement weather makeup days. Is there a second? Ms. Causey, I'll second, but I believe you forgot to specify that you mean the professional development days that are Muslim holidays. You said professional development days. I believe you meant professional development days that are Muslim holidays. Yes, that is that is what I intended to say. Could you replace could you restate that, please? Certainly. I want to make a motion that whichever calendar is adopted will include the Muslim holidays being maintained as professional development days and not considered for inclement weather makeup days. Back in row. Thank you. Is there discussion? Ms. Pasture has a question or a comment. Ms. Pasture? No, my hand was up prior to that, so my hand is up just in terms of talking about the calendar. I have no questions about what you just said. Thank you. Yes, there is a technical issue with this hand. So, okay. Um, if there are no questions or Ms. comments, then, yes. I do have a question because as I look at the calendar, um, and, and, and I'm hoping, and I believe you may have specified this, so you may have already answered my question, but there are system-wide professional development days. Um, the first one, I think, believe it being the 7th of September, which is Rosh Hashanah, right? Yes, that yes. Is, that's not one of the days that, that, that couldn't possibly be changed because of inclement weather, so that's a moot point, right? You're just talking specifically about the Muslim holidays, correct? Yes. Thank you. Board members, are there other questions or comments? Yes. And this is Molly. Yes. yes. Isn't the Muslim holidays, the Eid al-Fitr, recognized as professional holidays in both calendars regardless? So what is the point of this motion then? That it's not used as an inclement weather day? Previously, the professional development days for the Muslim holiday, Eid al fitr had been also labeled as a inclement weather day. And that is not equitable. Those holidays would be considered to be removed, um, which had been done in the past without board approval. Um, so this is just making it equitable. Okay, so Mr. Duke, is that true with this pre and post Labor Day calendar that Eid is scheduled for removal for uh, inclement weather? It's not specified specifically for removal. It, the 
footnote at the bottom of the calendar indicates that professional development days can be converted to makeup days if necessary. And we have had uh, inclement weather at the beginning of the school year. Normally what happens is because of the lateness of the Eid holiday in the school year, um, it may be susceptible to um, being converted, but we have never converted uh, either the, the Jewish religious holiday or the Muslim holiday uh, to a school day. Oh, I take it back. We did do it once. Um, two years ago, we did convert the uh, Eid um, to, a PD, uh, to a student day as a makeup day. Okay, thank you, Mr. Du. Ms. Causey? Yes. I don't know if you can see hands, but I have my hand up, Mr. Kuhn and Ms. Pasteur. Okay, so what I have seen is hands get stuck, stuck up. So, um, so at the top of the list, I see Dr. Hager, is that correct? I, I don't see her on my screen, so I, I can't answer that. Dr. Hager was first and my hand went up after her. Dr. Can somebody Hager? mute, please? Okay, we're not hearing from Dr. Hager. So, Ms. Pasteur? Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. I, I was saying, that, sorry, this is Erin. Um, I was uh, wanted to speak to the calendar in general, not to this motion in particular, which I very much support. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pasteur? Um, my comment is the same as Dr. Hager. I wanted to speak about the calendar in general, but not about the Muslim holiday. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mahamza? Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, I'm speaking to uh, support this motion. I think, uh, as you stated, um, it's equitable for everyone uh, where not, uh, there's no possibility that the Muslim holiday could be uh, used as a substitute for uh, increment weather. So I, I support this motion 100%, and I think it's a great motion, and our uh, Muslim students are going to be really proud of what our school system just did. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Mr. Kuhn? I'm sorry, I already made my comment and I lowered my hand. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Um, I don't know if I need to offer an amendment. I know we don't think of September as being inclement weather, but if we would have tornadoes or hurricanes, do we want to offer the same protection to both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? If you want to make that um, amendment, I think that's perfectly fine. I would accept that. I would like to make an amendment to um, state that we would protect Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, just as we would protect Eid um, for not being used for inclement weather of any I'll kind. Second. I'll second that amendment. Board members, any questions or comments about the amendment? Ms. Gover, can I have a roll call vote for Ms. Mack's amendment? No. Choose the truth. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. King? Yes. Ms. Pastier? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Penn? Yes. Ms. Joe? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Ms. Rowe? Yes. yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you, that motion carries. Board members, if there's no more questions or comments, we'll vote on my motion as amended by Ms. Mack. Ms. Gover, can we have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hess? Yes. Ms. Jost? 
Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. I want to thank my board members for that. This has been a long journey, and I had the opportunity. I'm taking a point of order of personal privilege. I had an opportunity to speak to uh, former board member, Ms. Romaine Williams, and uh, many that have been engaged in this uh, journey of equity um, will recognize her name because she really did the groundwork to uh, make this happen, to listen to the voices and to understand that that we need to have things be not just fair, but equitable. So uh, to Romaine Williams, I want to say thank you as a former board member who's done very important work and it is still uh, providing benefits today. So thank you. Um, now we're going to go to the uh, calendar in general. And Dr. Hager, I believe you were first. Hey, thank you. I actually would like to make a motion to approve the calendar option with the pre-Labor Day start. Second, Offerman. There's a motion and a second. Dr. Hager, you want to speak to your motion? Yes, happily. Um, this is actually one of the reasons I put my hat in the ring to become a board member, um, because as a, a family with two working parents, it's nearly impossible to find camps or other childcare options for children at the end of August or even worse, the beginning of September. And most camps close around the second week of August to accommodate the college students who, who staff the camps. So I actually worked as a camp counselor for several summers when I was in college. And so a post Labor Day start really puts those families with working parents, which is really the overwhelming majority of BCPS families at a in a huge bind with two to three weeks of summer uncovered. And we know that teachers are in that same boat, especially the later we start school, and the teachers with children rather, because when our teachers return to school prior to the start of the school year, they also need coverage for their children, which is, as I mentioned, nearly impossible to find after the second week of August. And TABCO has actually surveyed their members informally and consistently found that the overwhelming majority do prefer a pre-Labor Day start. And so um, shifting from that reason, I have several reasons for this. Um, in my day job um, as a public health researcher, I have actually researched the very real equity issues that long summers present for children from families with limited resources. So for these children, we see a disproportionate academic slide, in addition to disproportionate negative effect effects on health outcomes and increased risks for risky behaviors that can happen when uh, kids are unsupervised for long, long periods of time because their parents have to work and there's nowhere for them to go. And then finally, I just want to say that the, the sad truth that there's a very real chance that some or all of our children will not return to school in person this calendar year. And so I would argue that the sooner we can get our kids into buildings in August of 2021, the better. So I just really hope that my fellow board members will consider voting for a pre-Labor Day start for those students. Are there board members that have uh, discussion or questions related to was, Dr. Hager's motion? Oh, I was, Ms. No, Ms. I would like to speak to it. I was. Yes, Ms. Pastor. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I am as um, a, a schoolhouse person. I have been one for a post Labor Day start for many reasons, and um, I don't intend to go into it. But just listening, if nothing else, just listening to the conversation tonight and everything that we have been through since March not knowing where our children are. To my educator friends who contacted me about post, you'll have to hate me tonight because I have to support pre this year because our children need to be back with real instruction and God willing that by the time we start again, we won't have this but they need every moment to be able to get a hold of what it means to have a solid and real education. And I believe strongly enough, without doing a poll, a study, I believe strongly enough 
about those who are in our schools and in our classrooms, that they too, in their hearts, will know that with what we have had since March and clearly what we're going through now, we need to get them back in the classroom. Thank you. Ms. Causey, if you can't see, Mr. Mahamza has his hand up. Um, looks like Ms. Han has her hand up, and that's all I can see. Excuse me, Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, hello. Uh, like, uh, in previous years, I've also been uh, a post uh, Labor Day uh, uh, supporter, uh, especially since I used to. I, my, my family usually goes on vacations during that time. But really thinking about um, the calendar this year, especially with COVID, I think we have to go pre Labor Day. Uh, just that reason alone, um, our student, like Ms. Pastor said, our, we need to get our students back as soon as possible. But like Doc, but I do want to. Uh, emphasize on the points Dr. Hager has made uh, uh, the detriment of starting a post-Labor Day presents. And I think we really need to, uh, I just wanted to emphasize on what Dr. Hager said. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to support a pre-Labor Day start. So in the order of hands, Dr. Hager already spoke. Lisa, Ms. Mack. You're on mute. Let the next person go. I'm still trying to work something out on the calendar and then come back to me, please. Certainly, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, like Ms. Pasture said and Mr. Mahamza said, I too have supported a post-Labor Day start in previous years, not this year. Um, if it were in within my power to move Labor Day sooner, I would and still would support a pre-Labor Day start to go back as soon as possible. I think that was the theme of tonight's discussion. The board agrees we want to expedite the safe return of our students as soon as possible. So I will be supporting this motion and we need to get our kids back. So thank you, Dr. Hager. I have called all the names that the hands are up. Are there other board members that want to speak to this? Ms. Causey, this is Rod McMillian. I'd like to say something. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I have a generalized calendar question, whether it's pre or post. Mr. Duke, I mentioned the possibility of virtual snow days at the last meeting. And then Dr. Williams, there was a pause, and Dr. Williams said that we, you know, would get to engage the state in conversation, something like that. I'm paraphrasing. And then I read in this past week, weekly update, Dr. Hager asked several questions about the virtual snow days and i'm confused on the timeline for asking the state approval for virtual snow days you can't obviously wait until a snow day and then implement virtual that's something that has to be done way in advance in order to get the state's approval for it so can somebody address what i just presented about the timeline for asking the state for approval to make snow days virtual days. Thank you. The question was posed to MSDE and MSD responded with the um, guidance that we would have to go in after the fact and ask for a waiver. Okay, can I, how do you go in after the fact if a snow day occurs whatever day you can't implement virtual at that point so you're going to miss that day so how can you go in afterwards and then ask for a virtual snow day the guidance was that we would go in for a request of a waiver for the day and it would be our decision to go virtual and then they would have to either approve it or they would have to deny it. If it was denied, then we would have to make up the day. Mr. 
Kelly and I would um, suggest that if you wanted to make a motion related to that in terms of giving guidance uh, to the superintendent, um, what the board's preference would be, um, that that's something that you can consider. Um, we do have a motion that is seconded and discussion on the floor. Um, so I would like to move on to process that if that's okay with you, and then we can certainly come back to you. Certainly, thank you. Other board members? Ms. Causey, I can speak now. Um, I, I too um, have been a person who always looked at a post Labor Day start. But if for no other reason, I do support a pre-Labor Day start because our kids desperately need to get back to the classroom. I am a little bit concerned about our kindergartners with the pre-Labor Day start. They'll come back on a Wednesday, go to school Thursday and Friday, have off Monday, have off Tuesday. I think that'll be a bit disruptive to them, but for the rest of the students, um, I do support this motion. Thank you. So if um, Dr. Williams, if Dr. McComas would like to speak to the kindergarten entry plan because there are specific uh, reasoning for that, I believe. I'm sorry, Ms. Um, Kazi, could you say that again? I, I My volume, I had adjusted. So, so Ms. Mack had referenced the kindergarten start being just a few days and then a break and then a few days. But um, I believe that there's um, instructional reasons for that. Is that correct? Ye yes, there is a, typically we do a gradual entry uh, because there is a, a number of things that our teachers are working on um, with um, parent conferencing and assessing uh, students and where they are and, and building up those routines. Ms. Mack, we could not hear you. Thank you, Dr. McComas. My pleasure. Other board members speaking to um, the calendar issue, Dr. Hager's motion specifically? Um, yes, I have a question. Yes, Ms. Rowe. So the last day of school is July 16th on the pre-labor day, is that correct? It's the last day of classes. June. Or June 16th, sorry. That's correct. Okay, and then the last day for post-Labor Day is what? Twenty-third. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because with the different assessments and things, um, that's the only question I have. Thank you. So are there any other board members? Okay, hearing none, I will make um, my comments. I, um, for since my time on the board, have been a post-Labor Day start uh, for multiple reasons. Um, the greatest of which was the um, lack of air conditioning, which when I started on the board was over 52 schools without it. Um, but that reason has uh, been taken care of with uh, the work of many dedicated people. Um, the air conditioning with the COVID um, has been completed sooner. Um, and uh, so that that is not going to be a case. So that when we start, if whenever we start, that all the students will be in um, appropriately climate controlled classrooms. Uh, the other reason for the post Labor Day start uh, is related to family time. And uh, the other issue is related to our agricultural program that have their capstone event, if you will, at the Maryland State Fair. Um, and that is a very important industry, agriculture to the state of Maryland. And it's very important specifically to these children and families for whom many, this is a career. And even if they go to college, they're uh, getting into specific agricultural programs. Um, my concern this year is um, if we are, if conditions are improving and we have vaccines and different things are happening, I feel like we 
might need that extra time to ensure that we can start in person. So um, I guess one of the things that I would like to see is depending on the conditions at the time that the board would have a certain time to specifically reconsider based on conditions, whether we need to push the a start back. Um, this summer, I, I forget the number, but it was substantial number of schools in July ended up changing their school date, which, um, you know, can be disruptive. So I guess what I would do is make an amendment to Dr. Hager's motion that in June, the superintendent and the board will evaluate the start date given the uh, COVID pandemic impacts. Is there a second? Second, Hen. Thank you. Um, and just to speak to that for just a minute is, um, I do think that we, given the uncertainties of COVID and, and all of the disruptions that have happened, that in order to allow the school system, families and staff to plan, I think it would be good to have that as a set time to reevaluate and, and make sure that it's the best plan in order to bring all the students back in person. Board members, questions or comments? Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Jose. Yes. Uh, my only concern with that calendar, with that amendment is it's too late. June, we really should adopt the calendar this current year for 2021-22. It's not fair to parents and especially working parents that have to plan uh, what to do with children to change that at the nth hour in June. I think there'll be a lot of unhappy parents, regardless of whether it's post or pre, if we change the calendar in June. That's just my comment as a parent. Um, I would be upset. Thank you. So I certainly appreciate that. And as a parent, um, I I feel the exact same thing as working parents. We have uh, those issues that many have spoken to. Um, my concern is that we don't know what's happening with COVID. And just like this uh, past summer, plans that were made all had to be changed with very short notice. So this would just be a way for the board and the superintendent um, and his team to evaluate where we are. If it's all systems go, you know, everyone's been able to get the vaccine of their and 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 be ready to go, then that's fantastic because I agree. We our students need to our our students need to be in school. Um, so I'm just saying that that's a time to reevaluate. That would not preclude the board from voting on the schedule tonight. Any other board um, members? This this is Aaron Hager. I just want to add yes. to what Ms. Jost was saying. As, as you were talking, uh, Ms. Colsey, I was shaking my head thinking that it was making a lot of sense. And then as soon as Ms. Jost uh, spoke about working parents, I can tell you I, I started assembling my camp spreadsheet in early January. And so at that point, you know, I'm planning my whole summer and trying to figure out where I'm going to put my kids every week of the summer. So it, um, it really could put people in a bind. Um, and so I guess my question is, given that so many districts did have to reevaluate their calendar last year. Is that always just an option if, if there is a global pandemic or something that, that could cause you to have to reevaluate? So do we have to do it formally or is it something that's always at our disposal? Does that make sense? Yes, I, I hear your question and I guess um, it it is potentially always at our disposal, but it's like you said, and others have said, it's good to have a deadline and then you address things at a certain time and then you move on. This is Ms. Stein. I'm sorry, does that answer that, Dr. Hager? Thank you. And um, who spoke next? Ms. Stein, I moved the questions. Okay, there's a motion to move the question. Second. Second. Ms. Bressler, 
that's not debatable or it is debatable at this late hour. I'm not confused. Not, not debatable. I'm sorry, are we moving, are we moving the motion, the um, amendment or the motion or both? You, we're addressing the amendment first. Mrs. Causey, I wanted to make an amendment to your amendment, if that's possible. <laughs> uh, if board members can please mute their phones. Would you can you make an amendment if the question was moved? Don't we have to vote on that? I, I need Ms. Bressler to guide us. Yeah, you, you've called the question, so that has to be taken up first. That is priority. And it would be calling the, the question that's currently on the floor and whether that's going to be called or not. So. Okay. And there was some feedback, Ms. Bressler. So it's debatable or not debatable? Not debatable. Okay. Great. Ms. Gover, roll call vote. On, Dr. And this is on the amendment. Correct. Correct. Can we repeat yeah. the amendment, please, so everyone is clear? I'm it's sorry. To call the question on the amendment. It's to call the question on the amendment. Can we repeat the amendment, please? We're not voting on the amendment at this time. What are we voting on? Could we repeat what we were voting on so everyone is clear? We're, you moved to call the question on the current motion at the table, which is the amendment. So I'm voting to move. Question. Question. Correct. Okay, so as long as everybody's clear. Right. So my answer is yes, yes, you have the question. Yes, I have the question. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Right, so Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? Yes. Ms. Han? No. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. So we're Thank calling the question. question. Thank you. The motion carries. So now we are voting on the amendment that I made, which is to have the board of the superintendent in June evaluate the COVID pandemic and determine if a pre-Labor Day start would need to be moved at all. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Be Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pastor? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Mahunza? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Joe? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? I'll go with the rest of the board, no. Thank you. Okay, board members, any other discussion on Dr. Hager's pre-Labor Day start? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, roll call vote, please. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. So the next item on the agenda is unfinished business board policies. Members of the board, the policy review committee asked that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policy, policy 8250 board member responsibilities. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibit L. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved. Second, Mac. 
Oh, thank you. Board members, is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item M, board committee updates. And for that, we will go in the order uh, that is in board docs. Uh, starting with the audit committee and the chair of the audit committee is Ms. Rowe. Hi, so the audit committee uh, is going to be meeting next week. We're working still on charters and for the audit committee and for the office of internal audit. Uh, those can be, uh, you could review what we've been working on in the committee meeting in the last committee meeting. And uh, also the board has been given a, a way to see all of the uh, committee reports. If people have questions, you can email me questions. The other thing that we are working on is at the last committee meeting, the committee decided that we are going to have a committee meeting that is a committee meeting, but invite the full board so that the, our head of internal audit, Ms. Andrea Barr, can present to the full board information about the Office of Internal Audit without making our general meetings even longer. So we're going to be working on um, setting the date for that full committee meeting. So you, you'll probably be getting a doodle poll for it from Tracy and um, we'll move forward with that because I've had requests from board members to be able to hear directly from Ms. Barr on a regular basis. So we will probably be doing that about four times a year so that she can have that entire committee meeting to present to all the board members um, information that she wishes to present. Thank you. Next is building and contracts and the chair is Ms. Hen. Thank you. The Building and Contracts Committee last met on Tuesday, October 13th. We approved seven contract awards um, or recommended them for approval to the full board. They were approved by the full board on the same date and the details of those are in board docs. Thank you. Thank you. And next is a Curriculum Committee. And for that, I call on Chair Cheryl Pestor. Thank you. The curriculum meeting committee meets this Thursday. Um, we have some very interesting topics, so I would encourage people to uh, tune in. Please uh, share what we are doing uh, for our children. We're at that center of what a good school system is about, so please tune in. Also, even though this will not be on our agenda, I do want to thank Dr. McComas, Dr. Williams, and Dr. Mc members of Dr. McComas' staff for ensuring that all of our students on both sides of the county have sites uh, for the December SAT um, and making sure that there is equity, not just in where they go, but making sure that they can get to a site uh, easily and in a timely fashion. So thank you for following through on the things that needed to be done to that end. Thank you. And next is Equity Committee and Chair Makita Scott. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, at our last equity meeting, the equity committee met October 15th to discuss and review 
um, the board's uh, Board of Education's Policy 100. We examined what is Policy 100 and how it's applied. We discussed the requirements of Policy 100 and how BCPS fully implements Policy 100 system wide. Additionally, um, we discussed that it is not enough to say that as a system we are equitable, but we also must show how we are being equal to all of our um, schools. Additionally, the committee heard from Mr. Sarris and Dr. Scrivens. We would like to thank both of them for coming and doing presentations at the Equity Committee. And they shared with the committee and expanded our understanding of the BCPS um, budget construction process system-wide. And we learned how the process is equitable but it was also explained um, that um, we need to make sure not only is it equitable, but that it's equal to all of our schools. So we will build off of these presentations for our next meeting, which will be on November 12th, 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m., where we will discuss policy 3111 and reading for our children by grade three. And we will review how we are applying an equity lens to our earliest learners. Thank you. Thank you. And our next committee is Legislative and Government Relations Committee, and the chair is Ms. Pester. Thank you again. Uh, on November the 19th, the Legislative and Government Committee will meet for a very brief meeting to outline our meeting dates and to begin uh, identifying our board's legislative directions. Uh, for our, for the General Assembly and for ourselves to give us direction as the um, as we go through the rest of this year and in preparation for the opening of the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you. And the next, uh, the last committee is Policy Review Committee of which I um, have the privilege of being the chair. Our last meeting was on October 19th, and we had a, um, many things on the agenda, including our board meeting and board meeting agenda policies. Uh, we also began an initial discussion around board ethics policies. Uh, we also started the discussion where the board had passed a resolution in May, uh, a waiver of policy related to the COVID pandemic, and uh, there'll be, um, staff will have discussion with the, the superintendent related to um, the need for that or uh, the ability to um, remove that. Um, also, there is discussion important on um, including when pol board policies are reviewed. Um, they typically say the superintendent would implement them or the board would implement them. And there was discussion about um, including further detail in terms of the how. So for board policies uh, that would uh, in the future indicate procedures, standing, standard operating procedures, uh, that would be part of the implementation process. Um, also, it was brought up at that meeting uh, that we wanted to have a special presentation on special education um, and the uh, laws and regulations that impact that. And so we appreciate uh, staff uh, preparing that for a future meeting. Um, and also there was a uh, request in future meetings to uh, discuss the current suspension and expulsion policy and the impact on our special needs students related to that. Um, upcoming November 16th, uh, we're going to be discussing again policy 8311 meetings, uh, the board um, resolution and the waiver of policies, and then additional new business is policy 1290 closing of school buildings, Policy 6000, Curriculum and Instruction. Policy 6002, Selection of Instructional Materials. Um, we also appreciate that Curriculum and Instruction will be bringing a presentation uh, related to our work on Policy 5210, Grading and Reporting, and then the presentation by the Office of Law uh, regarding special education law. So thank you to all the committee members. And again, all, there are links on board docs where you can connect directly with the agenda, the minutes, and also the upcoming meetings. So the next item on the agenda is new business. And for that, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, under board committee updates, 
Um, the next item, item two, is consideration of a budget committee. And for that, I call on Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Policy 8120 outlines the purpose, role, and responsibilities of the Board of Education of Baltimore County as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland. The board has full authority and jurisdiction over all educational matters affecting Baltimore County and shall promote the interests of the schools under its jurisdiction. The board is obligated to exercise its lawful budgetary authority to propose adequate funding for current and proposed staffing guidelines. The board's duties include preparing an annual budget for the operating and capital needs of the school system. The board, as the governing body of the school system, fulfills its mission by adopting policies concerning the budget financial reports, major expenditures, and payment of obligations. I therefore move that the board establish a standing board budget committee to examine issues related to the operating and capital budgets in order to ensure that maximum resources are allocated to schools in support of the board's goal to promote continued advancement of student achievement for all student groups in Baltimore County Public Schools. I further move that the board direct the superintendent to provide staffing and support to the committee to assist the board in achieving this objective. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Thank you. Ms. Hen, do you want to speak further to your motion? I believe my motion speaks for itself. This is something I believe strongly in. It's one of the board's most important statutory obligations. And it's a, a budget committee has been established in all of the other large school districts in the state of Maryland. So I believe at one time Baltimore County did have a budget committee. It's long overdue that we establish one of our own. I believe it will go a long way towards a greater and more efficient process in our own budget deliberations and will ensure that we are able to do our due diligence and meet our statutory obligations. So I thank my board colleagues for their consideration of this important motion. Board members, discussion on Ms. Penn's motion. I see Ms. Mack, is that no, accurate? I, um, no, um, I, Ms., it looks like Ms. Joes has her hand up if you can't see it, Ms. Causey. Okay, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Ms. Hen, did you say that the board prepares the budget? Because from my understanding, the superintendent prepares the budget and the board approves that budget, which we have done diligently in the past two years. This board has approved the budget for 2020 and 2019 last year as well. Um, so I was a bit confused in your wording of your motion. Is that something I misheard? And secondly, who do you anticipate on this budget committee? Thank you, Ms. Joes. This language is directly from board policy um, and annotated code. So 8120, and that policy does reference the um, code. So you can look up the references there, and the language is pulled directly from the policy and the code. In terms of membership, that would be determined by the board chair. So that is not part of my motion. Thank you for your okay. question. Thank you. And you did mention that um, large jurisdictions have um, budget committees. I looked around and the only large jurisdiction that I saw having a budget committee or something close to it is Howard County. And the way they've made it equitable is they have every councilmanic district represented in that budget committee. In our board, that would be all seven councilmanic districts would have to be represented in order to make it equitable. In that case, that's a board quorum. That's just an observation. So thank you. Thank you, and I can respond to, to that. I provided the board separately a list of the larger school districts um, with enrollments greater than 50,000 other than our own, and all have either a standing committee, a citizens advisory committee, or both. Um, Baltimore City's budget committee um, meets, I believe it's seven or eight times a year, and they receive budget updates at each of those meetings, along with information that we receive informally now. I don't believe that information is shared with the public and believe that it's important that we're as transparent as possible and that information be shared. So that is one model that I believe we could emulate with this. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you. board members, I do not see any hands. 
Ms. Causey, this is Rob McMillian. I have a question. Yes, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Hen, would you entertain the, the possibility of having all of the Board of Education members on this committee? Thank you, Mr. McMillian. As you're aware, all board committee meetings are open to the full board um, for participation, as long as we avoid having a quorum of the full board. So um, participation, as any other committee, would be fully welcome. Um, in terms of operating as a committee of the whole, that might be cumbersome. So I was not envisioning that per se. However, um, as I mentioned, we have board members participating committees to which they are not assigned all the time. And this committee would be no exception. Does that answer your question? In re response to that, I know it's a short term committee, but we do have all the board members involved in uh, the looking for the legal help that we're, uh, we're going to pursue. Secondly, I'm concerned that if a small group of people, you know, could could really control that, and where and I'm I'm concerned, like Ms. Joe's mentioned, the councilmatic districts. If I'm not on that committee, or if I'm on that committee, I'm out and I'm outnumbered by other people that want to see, you know, the possibilities of the money going someplace else. You know, then my constituents lose out. Uh, when, even if I'm on the meeting, if I'm outnumbered then I lose, my people lose out. I Thank like the idea of all of us being on that. Thank you. Thank so you, Ms. Mr. Hen, Ms. Hen, if I May I respond to Mr. McMillian's comments? Yes, but I did want to correct something please, that you please. had said earlier about the quorum. If okay. I may. Sure, please. So it was, it was pointed out um, by uh, Ms. Howie, and you can uh, refresh my memory. Um, when Ms. Hen and I um, became chair and vice chair, um, we decided to open up the committee operations so that while we would have a committee, chair, vice chair, one or two or three members, depending on the, um, the work and the interest, um, but that any board member could come to those committee meetings and participate in terms of asking questions, being part of discussion, um, but they would just not be eligible to vote. And since the standing committees are um, uh, live streamed and open to the public, agendas published and on the website available in advance, um, the committee is completely transparent um, and certainly board members can work with board members on the committee if there are certain things that they want to have addressed. Um, I think so, so I just wanted to clarify that point about the quorum. So if there's a committee and it has three or four people, but all 12 people want to come to one meeting, um, that is possible because it will be open. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that um, clarification, Mrs. Causey. And if I may respond to Mr. McMillian's other concern about um, decisions being made by this committee. Um, the actions taken by the board on the budget are taken by the full board and any requests for information could be facilitated by this committee or discussed in committee. So one of the issues we've run into year after year since I've been on the board has been um, the lengthy discussions by board members during budget season that have gone until all hours of the night that have been um, anything but effective. And these are discussions that the board reached consensus on need to happen year round. And this committee will be a venue to facilitate those discussions and to have greater relationships with staff, to have the conversations that need to happen year round. And as Mrs. Fozzie said, all board members are welcome to participate in that. No decisions will be made in terms of having influence over that budget. That's something I'm sensitive to as well. And those decisions will still be enacted by the full board as they are now on the budget. Similarly to, and I draw the um, analogy of how the Building and Contracts Committee operates where recommendations are brought to the full board and then enacted by the full board. And so the two members of the I'd, board. I'd, I'd, I'd just like to comment on, I can attend every meeting, but if I can't vote or if, if I'm outvoted by a, a group of people that want to go a different direction than I do, then my people, my constituents lose out again. Thank you. 
So excuse me, members of the board, just want to clarify one uh, point. Uh, it was mentioned that all board members could attend a committee meeting. That is true, there is no restriction on attendance. However, if every board member attends a committee meeting, it's no longer a committee. It's then the board meeting. And then the question would be whether or not the board is properly provided notice under the Open Meetings Act that the board is meeting. Thank you for that clarification. So everyone can attend, but only the first six can have conversation and discussion? Well, again, if you receive notice from members uh, of the board who are not officially members of the committee that they wish to attend, then the notice would be changed. Oh, I see. Okay, yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. And Ms. Rowe, is your hand up? Yes, it is. So. I just wanted to clarify that the work of this committee would not be to make decisions about the budget. So what exactly would you vote on? So because if the committee is supposed to be um, just receiving information and learning and talking to the school system and getting that information out to the public, then theoretically there would never be a vote on anything other than to keep asking the school system for information. Is that correct? Um, well, Ms. Rowe, as you, you're aware, um, serving on the Building and Contracts Committee, the committee makes recommendations to the full board, and we vote on those recommendations. So while the committee wouldn't be taking actions as a full board, as the only the full board can take actions, the committee can make recommendations and it would be voting on those recommendations, as well as requesting information from staff, receiving reports that the committee requests from staff, and then delivering that information to the full board. The committee could also facilitate requests on behalf of the board, so that if a member were interested in a particular topic, they could choose to um, request that information through the committee to facilitate that and have that meeting specifically on that topic, because let's face it, we can't get to every topic in these meetings, and we certainly can't do the board, um, the budget rather justice through these meetings. It's a sure, two billion dollar sure. budget. Sure, and we do stay up very late discussing the budget. But when, so when the committee is making these um, discussions and these recommendations, does that mean that the board could potentially be hearing budget related motions for the upcoming budget far in advance? Or would we still only be deliberating on the budget at the usual time of year that we deliberate on the budget? I'm just trying to figure out exactly how this is how this is going to operate. Right. So the the intent is not to change the deliberation process on the budget as it currently stands. Those actions are taken by the full board, just as any contract approvals are taken by the full board. So again, I would use the Building and Contracts Committee operations as the model here um, to think about how this committee will operate. The okay. committee will provide recommendations to the board, but it will not be taking action on the budget. Okay, contracts happen every meeting though. Does that mean we're gonna have budget votes every meeting? That's up to the board to decide. Currently the process is we don't receive the budget at every meeting. We receive a budget, a proposed budget once a year. We have um, a few work sessions on that budget and then we vote to approve it. And we make motions um, to modify it at those work sessions. So that process, this motion does not suggest or recommend any changes to that process. It simply creates a mechanism by which board members can be informed about the budget and get questions answered throughout the year. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Uh, I have Miss Mack and then Dr. Hager. Um, I just wanted to speak to Mr. McMillian's um, concern. Um, during our inaugural meeting for the Equity Committee, I um, created a 37-item um, spreadsheet asking for information for all of our schools 
so that as an equity committee, we could make sure that when we make decisions around anything, around staffing, around budget, around resources, around capital dollars spent for maintenance or new schools, that we had an at-a-glance look that compared all of our schools so that we made very equitable decisions. We, I haven't received that yet, but I would think that that's a tool that a budget committee could use to allay some of your concerns, Mr. McMillian, because I know that all of us want dollars to be allocated adequately to our areas and to the areas with the greatest need. So I don't know if you were aware of that, um, but I wanted to mention that. And um, also just to share my support for this because I spent a lot of time on the budget last year and um, I don't wanna be on a call until two o'clock in the morning this year. And to the extent that this effort will facilitate an ongoing communication between board members and staff and that we are part of the process, I fully support it. Thank you. And Mr. McMillian, I can send you that if you like. Thank you. Um, and, uh, Ms. Rowe okay. and Ms. Mack asked my question, so I can, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. So is there any other board member that remains with a question? Okay, hearing no further um, questions or discussion, Ms. Hey, Gilbert, no, may we have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hey, Hager? Tell me something everyone knows about pandas. Excuse yes. me, someone I needs to mute something. their phone. Uh, Dr. Hager? I said, I said, sorry, yes. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Pastor? Uh, I was out most of the discussion. I'm going to abstain. No. Mr. Mahomsa? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joe? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Max? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Favor six. I'm sorry, what was that? Favor is six. It failed. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, agenda item is Item N, New Business Contract Awards. And for that, we call on Dr. Scrivens, Mr. Saris, Mr. Dixit, and uh, Mr. Committee Mr. Chair, Ms. Hen. Vice Chair Hen, we'll turn it over to you, ma'am. Thank you. One moment, please. Can everyone hear me? Okay, tech problems tonight. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items N1 through N8 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Point of order, Ms. Uh, Hen, this is uh, Molly. I had made, you had made a motion to separate out item N8 at the beginning of the meeting. My motion was to add it to the agenda, Ms. Joes. I asked for it to be separated. Can I make that motion now that N8 be separated since I have not seen it to as of now? So Ms. Hen, at the, at, at the agenda setting time, we did address the issue of having N8 separated to be discussed separately. Yes. Since. So if you can restate your Okay, can, can I ask a committee, question? The committee um, recommended N1 through N8. We did not um, separate any out. So, Mrs. Causey, I would ask you to ask for the motion to separate or to um, approve N1 through N7. 
So the so you're requesting a motion to approve items N1 through N7. The recommendation from the committee was N1 through N8. Ms. Joes asked that we separate out N8. Actually, I would like a point of clarification because I believed in the beginning of the motion when you were adding it to the agenda, I asked for it to be separated and it was agreed that we would bring in N1 to N7 and then N N8 would be separated out and um, I believe that was the motion. If somebody else could clarify. Uh, that, Ms. Joes, that was my recollection. This is a way of dividing a question. Thank you. We separate items to vote on each one individually all the time. So if the request is to separate a contract out to vote on it separately, there's no reason we can't do that. Correct. I just wanted to make it clear that the committee recommended N1 through N8. That's all. It's just a matter of procedure. Thank you. Okay, can we separate that out, Ms. Hen, please? Sure. Or do I have to make a motion? No, oh, we can separate it. Separate. All right, thank you. To do. Ms. Cosby, back to you. Thank you. Uh, so, board members, is there a motion to approve items N1 through N7? So moved, Roe. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Can somebody mute their phone, please? Um, I, I do have a question about the uh, about N1. Um, yeah. I have to get back to it on my, my computer. Um, so private duty nurses is it seemed to be a, a big increase in uh, funding over this period of time. Is this due to um, a shortage of school nurses or is this, um, could, could someone explain this a little bit to me? This is Sarah's. Uh, yes, good evening, Dr. Hager. Uh, this is based on uh, the increasing uh, needs of primarily special education students. Uh, the number of um, identified students is increasing at a greater pace than enrollment is increasing. Um, and we're just trying to keep pace with, with their needs of, of students. So these are not school nurses. These are nurses that are assigned to children with significant special needs. Correct. Correct. Medically fragile students in many cases, students who must be accompanied by a nurse uh, while on the bus in transportation to and from uh, not only our schools, but also non-public schools. Okay, and are they the term private duty nurse to me? I think in the medical field that they're, you know, contract nurses. Are these employees of the school system that are just working privately with one on one with a child? Is that the, what the term is? Yeah, these are, we, we contract with six different agencies to, who provide nurses of, of different qualifications. Um, RNs, LPNs, uh, et cetera, um, and at different rates, so that none of these are employees. Um, and, and we have a different contract that we use for substitute school nurses. I just know that often agency nurses are significantly more expensive, you know, to, to hire than, you know, hiring a nurse straight out, so. Um, thank you. I, I was confused about some of the language, so I appreciate that clarification. Mr. Sarris, I just wanted to follow up on that. Do we have an increasing number of students? And no, is there any an relation to COVID? Uh, we have an increasing number of uh, IEPs among 
our existing student population um, with so the special ed population is growing uh, despite the fact for instance this year that our overall enrollment has not has you know reduced actually so it's it's the greater number of needs identified among the existing student body thank you other board members with questions or discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hecker? Defeated by... Yes. Mr. Kuhn? You may not have been defeated at all. Yes. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. May I have a motion to approve item N8? So moved, Matt. Thank you. No second is needed because the recommendation came from the committee. Board members, are there, um, excuse me, Ms. Hen, do you want to, um, oh, actually, board members, the uh, there is the document that's been attached to board docs item. Um, where is the document? It's um, at number eight. If you refresh board docs, it may show up. Yes, my board docs has been going since early today. <laughs> it's there, Madam Chair. N8. Thank you. So, board members, is there a question or discussion? Ms. Kalasi? Yes. Um, this document was just uploaded on um, a few minutes ago, so I am just looking at it right now. This is a new contract. Uh, my concern with this is that uh, we, the board had previously approved $24,099, just under the threshold of $25,000, and this is adding another $25,000, which gets aggregated. Based on how we've expended that amount in the past three, three months, my concern is we are projected to expend this and we don't even have a proper procurement uh, document out yet. So based on that, based on uh, state procurement laws and my understanding of um, how these are done in good conscience, I cannot vote for this. Um, it, at such short notice, I would have had to have at least a week to have looked at it and ask questions to Mr. Saris um, and uh, the procurement uh, procedural uh, aspect. So I will vote no on it. Uh, the rest of the board is free to do as they want. Just based on my professional experience, I'm going to vote no. Thank you. So, Mr. Saris, if you could uh, address the issues related to the dollar amounts. And uh, it was addressed, um, I had the opportunity to attend Building and Contracts Committee this afternoon. Um, where you address the dollar amounts and the updated law. Could you work through that again, please? Yes. So, um, so our departmental procedures have have followed the the former state procurement threshold of twenty five thousand uh, dollars for what are classified as small procurements, which need not be competitively bid. And in May of 2017, that state threshold was increased uh, by a House bill that was uh, signed into law uh, from $25,000 to $50,000. And, and we are uh, subject to that state procurement article 13-109 and we have just never had occasion to bring uh, uh, an item before the board. But uh, in this case, 
Um, we have the because we're working on a procurement for legal services and we still need interim services, uh, we decided that under the law we can bring this forward up to $50,000 and we will just amend uh, our departmental procedure at this time uh, to align with state procurement law and establish that $50,000 threshold for small procurement, which, which does not require a formal bid. Correct, and I understand that because this is for a competitively bid um, the RFP that is being issued out, but you and I both know that then the next three months, this is not gonna happen. Having worked in this for 20 years, the fact is that this is going to aggregate again based on the projections of what I've seen. This board has expended on board legal expenses. We will be back again here with another small um, contract asking you for another twenty-five thousand, and that to me is something that would be then found as a procurement violation. Um, so it's in, again, like in good faith, I would need to see where our expenditures are going. If we had an RFP in the works, I would have been more comfortable to vote for this. Uh, the point is we are nowhere close to the holidays are coming up this Christmas. So I know how these things work, how it's gonna get ex extended out. So um, given that, what are we gonna do? Bring another change order another after Christmas for a 24.99 to go under the threshold? And that is my concern again, which would be a finding in the board doc, you know, for the uh, procurement laws that we have been flagged. So um, the rest of the board, again, like I said, can do what they want. I'm going to vote no. Thank you. So I'm just going to make a comment that um, uh, Mr. Sarris and, and the uh, work of the fiscal services uh, department, uh, that it is. Uh, that they're bringing us this recommendation in in good faith with their experience and um, there are issues from time to time um, when building and contracts does bring forward uh, contracts um, that are of an immediate nature so this is not an unusual occurrence and actually this is quite a small amount um, given the other things that are addressed Mr. Sarris, is it fair to say that the operating procedures that were currently limiting small purchases to 25,000 were inaccurate given the state law? Well, they just have lagged behind and we we just never uh, independently had reason to come to the board and ask uh, asked for its endorsement to make that alignment with the the more recent state law. So this is that opportunity, and uh, that's really the only basis that we could um, present a contract modification under these circumstances. Thank you. So other board members, excuse me, other board members. Wait. I'm sorry, Ms. Jones, are we going to two questions for board member promotion? Ms. Scott, Ms. Bressler? My, uh, no, I understand it's so two questions. I have um, two minutes, so are there any other members, I guess, that would like to speak? I yes, have my hand up. Ms. Mack and Ms. Rowe. Uh, Mr. Saris, I, I just want to touch base on what Ms. Um, Causey just said. Had we updated our operating procedures based on House Bill 13109 back in May of 2017, this would be a non-issue. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. So we are not violating anything. We just, our operating procedures are not as updated as they need to be as it pertains to this particular issue. Correct. We've state law prevails in these matters. Uh, we we can't exceed that limit, but we've just been operating beneath it uh, because we've had no demonstrated need to to adopt that change internally. 
So for the matter at hand, we are within the law and we are within the procurement process. Is that correct? Correct. Now, when okay, we get thank to you, Mr. Saris. Yes. Ms. Rowe? Mr. Saris, could you explain the implications um, for this board if we were to fail to approve this spending authority? Well, I think we would have to economize uh, in the use of of our of the board attorney. We just don't have the authority to continue. Um, retaining their services at the rate that we've been doing in the last couple of months. So is it fair to say that that would leave this board without legal counsel? It, with, with much scaled back legal counsel, I think, yes. Thank you. Other board members with questions or comments? Ms. Gover, can we have a roll call vote, please? No, my hand is up, Ms. Causey. And I think Ms. Dr. Ms. Hager's name. Oh, Ms. Pesture, thank you. Uh, and I think Dr. Hager is, has hers up as well. Um, thank you. All right, I, I do need some clarification here. I understand uh, that we were under uh, what the law is that it, it with the uh, 24999. Um, and so this is to bring it up to what is now permitted. Uh, but my concern is that it, in three months, we got through that old amount. And by the end of the year, if that process continues, we will um, have gone through this next part. And and. Until we do something different and on a more permanent basis, we might have to come back again. I'm just concerned without more conversation and looking at this. I mean, I, we're at a point we need to have legal services, so I get that. Um, I, I guess I'm just um, concerned that we might be going into a hole here. And I'd like to hear from you, Mr. Saris what that picture looks like to you from your standpoint, because I am concerned about the amount and the short period of time in which we spend it. Well, I don't, I don't have any options to recommend beyond the, the $50,000 limit. I think we're really stuck. So we have, um, we, we can work at this from two directions. One is to work on expediting our procurement uh, for legal services. And two is to consider some way um, to possibly scale back the hours that, that we retain the attorney uh, if possible, restructuring their assignments. Um, I don't know what the other services provided outside of the board meetings are in every case. So if there are things that can be deferred research items, uh, th those are my best suggestions. Thank you. So at this point, we're between that proverbial proverbial rock in a hard place because we're out of money. Thank you. So just to address the, the money issue, so the typically the board council fees are handled through the law office. The board office budget is um, quite small. So initially the uh, funding is coming from the board budget because it was supplemental. Um, but Dr. Williams has made, evaluated the situation and has made an adjustment. So what uh, the budget that was set aside in the law office is going to be able to be utilized. So that, that situation has been addressed by Dr. Williams. 
And uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hager, I believe you had a question as well. Just a quick question. I know that um, we are planning to address our specific criteria for legal services at the next uh, administrative session. Is it appropriate to wait to approve this until we've made those decisions, or are they are they not are they apples and oranges? They they feel like they're somehow linked, especially based on what Ms. Jost was saying. Um, or are we at a time point where we have to approve this tonight? Uh, we. We do not have to approve this tonight. Uh, I understand that the the outstanding bills that we've received are uh, in the twenty two thousand dollar range so far, um, not including tonight. Hi, Ms. Causey, I have a comment if Dr. Yes. Hager's finished. Just uh, real quick, um, Dr. Saris, this in essence is just, we're adding more money to a contract that we already have, which we constantly do on this board. I've been through enough of these contract discussions to realize that that, that happens in $25,000 you know, sounds like a lot of money, but our contract modifications are usually in the millions, hundreds of thousands to millions. So in order to pay for our legal representation so that we don't run out of money between now and the 24th when we have our next meeting, I will be I voting will be for this, this. And then we can move forward and hopefully um, get that RFP no. out. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board members before we call, uh, before we have the vote? This is Ms. Scott. Yes, I have a question. I don't know if you see my hand or not. No, it's not working. Oh, Go ahead, oh. Ms. Scott. Okay, yes. Um, my question is just a very basic one. Um, and I've been listening to what everyone has said. And I'm just wondering, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Sarris, is this a bit um, sort of backwards? Um, wouldn't we update the procedures first before um, approving like the RFP and, and, and everything like that? That's my first question. Um, typically, I think that's true. Um, we've just never had, it, an occasion has never presented itself. Um, and but we can uh, this in this case the state law prevails and we can take action under under that authority and and bring our internal procedures into alignment um, tomorrow. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, is that you're saying under normal circumstances we would update our um, our procedures uh, first, but I guess because of, I, I'm not sure why you're saying that um, we are going to bring, uh, I, I, I guess that's where I'm a little confused. What you're saying is that we are going to approve this first before before updating our procedures. And then that makes me question, and I need you to understand, I need you to, um, uh, to confirm for me, are we following state procurement laws and BCPS procurement laws? Because I don't want to be out of line with either of those. And I would need you to confirm that for me. Thank so, you. So we are in complete compliance with board policy, superintendent rule, and state procurement law. Um, the only uh, adjustment we need to make is to our internal uh, Office of Purchasing Procedure. Uh, we have not been heretofore aware that um, the, the board might be interested in raising this threshold to align with state law. And so it was never something that, that my department initiated, but this, this situation has presented itself because of these uh, special circumstances, and I believe it's a good time uh, 
to go ahead and make the change uh, for this contract and going forward. I'd like to move the question. Second. Ken. I'm sorry, who moved that? Lisa, Lisa Mack. Thank you. Okay, so there, it's not debatable, so we will have a roll call vote on moving the question, which means the next issue will be taking a vote. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Fester? Epstein. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Coffey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. So we are now taking the vote on approving item N8 as recommended by the Building and Contracts Committee. Ms. Gover, can we do the roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Pastor? Ms. Pasture? Ms. Ch Ms. Pasture, can you hear me? Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Mahomza? Abstain. Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Cosby? You're muted. Thank you. The motion carries. Was that a yes, Ms. Coffey? Yes, I couldn't hear your vote. We couldn't hear your vote. Yes, I said yes. Thank and you. so, yes, the motion carries. And now we are moving on to item O, consideration of privately funded capital project. And for that, we call on Ms. Byers to present. So good evening again, everyone. Tonight I'm bringing forward for approval a privately funded capital improvement project to create a butterfly garden at Glendon Elementary School. This project is being funded by a donation from a Glendon Elementary uh, parent. She is a volunteer. The donor has provided $181.60 to purchase a butterfly garden unit for the Glendon Elementary garden plot. The donor will cover any uh, cost overruns and the price of the garden unit is reflected in the quote from Herring Run Nursery. In accordance with policy in rule 7330, this request has progressed through all the normal internal processes for review. Thank you, Ms. Byers. Do I have a motion to approve the Glendon Elementary School Butterfly Garden Project? So, so moved, moved, Mac. Kuhn. Second, Kuhn. Second, Mac. <laughs> sorry, <Thank I'm> sorry. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote on this very worthy project? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Mahomza? Mr. Mahomza? Yes. 
Ms. Pam? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McWilliam? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. And the next item is consideration of a privately funded capital project, Pleasant Plains Elementary School tree planting. Yes, so next I am bringing forward for approval the privately funded capital improvement project to plant 37 trees at Pleasant Plains Elementary School. Blue Water Baltimore is being paid by the Baltimore County Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability to plant the trees. The project was initiated by the Pleasant Plains Elementary Go Green Club. A parent of a student helped to complete the request to be considered for the tree planting project through Blue Water Baltimore. The value of the donation is $11,285. This includes 37 trees and supplies as well as the implementation and the maintenance of the project for three years. And three years is the time frame in which you need to monitor trees. Um, the donor will be responsible for any cost overruns. And again, in accordance with policy and rule 7330, this request has progressed through all of our normal internal processes of review. Board members, may I have a motion to accept the um, privately funded capital project at Pleasant Plains Elementary School for the tree planting project? So moved. Who moved? Row. Thank you. Ms. Ten, thank you. Is there any discussion? Whoa. I did have a question um, related to this. Pleasant Plains Elementary School has been um, incredibly overcrowded for years and to such an extent that we had to do a redistricting, a, a boundary study. And so there has not been a recommendation to uh, long-term uh, solve over, overcrowding. So I just wanted to understand that where these trees are being planted, and I'm looking at the uh, photo that was included, mm -hmm. uh, that that would not preclude an addition or some other uh, needed improvement at that school in order to better uh, take care of the children there. So thank you for that question. Um, as you can see from those photos, which are in the last few pages of the packet, the trees are going on the perimeter of the property. And so um, to my knowledge, uh, that would not impact any future projects um, as part of the internal process for review, this does go through uh, Mr. Dixit and facilities. So they would have had an opportunity to review that. Okay, thank you. And also on this picture, I don't see any of the relocatable classrooms. Is this a recent picture or is this prior to the relocatables or have the relocatables been moved this summer? The relo um, some of the relocatables were moved this summer after the boundary study. Okay, I don't, I, know when, but I, don't, I don't know when the photo was taken, Ms. Causey, so I don't want to speak to the time of the photo. Okay, I just, uh, on my visits there, I, of course, have noticed them, and I thought one was near that section E. So I guess Mr. Uh, Dixit's not here, but... Okay, as long as they've edited it, that's good. Anyone no, else? I'm, I'm still here, and I just wanted oh, you I... to know, <laughs> a lot of times these Google pictures are old, so I don't know what you're looking at. Um, but it's attached to board docs. Yeah. So what Ms. Byers is saying is right, that our team has looked at it, and uh, trees are at the right location, and they will not have any impact on placement of any relocatables. Uh, what about any future additions or other improvements? At this time, we do not see that as an issue. Okay, because the cafeteria, if I recall, is right on that end, and I and I know from experience it's quite small. Okay, as long as you've edited it, that's awesome. Any other board members? 
Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Dr. Hager? Yes. June? Yes. Buster? <coughs> yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Mahomza? He Ms. left. Ken? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Yes. Thank the motion you. carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Byers. The next item on the agenda is board member comments, and we will go around and um, typically it would have been three minutes, but now we're down to two minutes. So we can, uh, we'll go around as the dais. So Dr. Hager. Okay, I just have a few comments jotted down. I just want to thank uh, BCPS for presenting the K-12 opening plan tonight and to say that I look forward to hearing the additional plans in a few weeks based on the motion passed tonight. And although I believe that we missed our window for reopening this fall, I truly hope that our full operational reopening plan is fully vetted and negotiated so that as soon as it is safe, we can reopen. And I wanted to thank my fellow board members for supporting a pre-Labor Day start for the next school year. And I would challenge the calendar committee and BCPS as a whole to seriously consider the idea of year-round school with a break in the fall and a break in the spring and a shortened summer break in the future. I think that's really where uh, a lot of districts are, are headed and it does seem to um, have an academic impact. Um, and so finally to our BCPS community, I have, I hope that you all have a happy and safe Thanksgiving and I hope that everyone has already gotten their flu shot. And if not, please go get it quickly. That's it. Mr. Kuhn. Well, my gift to everyone is two minutes of silence. So I will, I will pass. Ms. Pastor. Okay. I want to thank very sincerely uh, Dr. Williams, Dr. Zarchin, Dr. Roberts um, for one, allowing me in what was close to my personal hysteria about the uh, four special schools uh, for allowing me to visit my school, Ridge Ruxton, I needed to see what the teachers would have seen and, and with what they would have been met had they gone this oh, yesterday. Um, and so I really do want to thank Ms. Beltran and Ms. Giller for their hospitality. And I can clearly see that they worked diligently um, to prepare to receive their teachers. Um, I believe they were going to have, someone asked about the numbers, about 40 students coming in, which is about a third of their population. Um, so they have been thinking, but I have to admit that I'm happy that the teachers didn't have to go back and that the students have not had to go back yet. And in my heart of hearts, yes, um, I appreciate what Ms. Max said earlier. I still hold to them not being the first group to go in. But um, I do thank you, Dr. Williams, and, and the staff and the school personnel for receiving me and answering my questions, which I'm sure after a while got on everyone's nerves. But you were very gracious, so thank you. Ms. Offerman? Is, did Ms. Offerman leave the meeting? Okay, and Mr. Mahomza has left the meeting, so Ms. Hen? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I too am thankful. This is the season of thankfulness. I'm thankful for our parents, our teachers, our students, our administrators, of course, our wonderful central staff, Dr. Williams, 
I, I can't think of a new superintendent, and you still qualify as new, at least till the two-year mark, I've been told, who has um, had to bear more than you have had to bear in this last um, year and a half. So thank you very much. Um, but I want to spend this time, and I know I'm limited on time, so I'll try to keep this brief, thanking my board colleagues. You're here because you choose to be here. And that is a commitment that only you know the depth of. And I, I prepared comments for each of you, which I'll try to get through, although I do appreciate Mr. Kuhn's comments about the gift of time. So I will try to make this, this fast. Ms. Mack, thank you for your diligence and focus on student achievement and your selfless service to improve the system for learner outcomes. Mr. Mahamza, for reminding us of what truly matters and why we are here, and for fearlessly using your voice to serve in the best interests of all students. Dr. Hager, thank you for your engagement and your presence and your contributions to our, you always can make meaningful contributions to your discussions and you make data cool again. So I really appreciate that. Mr. Offerman, thank you for your steadfast and mindful commitment and sharing your wisdom with us and a perspective that only you bring to the board. Mrs. Causey, thank you for giving your all every day, all day. You've served longer than anyone on the board and your heart clearly shows that you're in it for children. Thank you. Ms. Joes, your commitment to our students, their clean water, to equity and the expertise you bring to the board for contracting and procurement are gifts that this system has needed. For their may I borrow from Mr. Kuhn's and Mr. Bombs' time, if I may continue? Mr. Kuhn, do you yield your time to Ms. Hen? I yield my time to the fair woman from Perry Hall. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Scott, your achievements with um, founding our equity committee this year um, have been bar none. Thank you so much for your work on that committee. I am so excited by your work and cannot wait to see what that committee achieves. Ms. Pasteur, I wanna thank you for your wisdom and for knowing that the questions we ask are often more important than the answers we receive. Mr. McMillian, Thank you for modeling warmth, sincerity, and a reminder to be yourself, no matter who others may want you to be. Ms. Rowe, thank you for showing the bravery to speak your mind and to ask the questions that others may be thinking but won't ask, and for your knowledge of a cornucopia of topics, including Robert's Rules of Order. Mr. Kuhn, thank you for sharing your gifts of time of logic and reasoning and sound data-driven decision-making. And thank you for yielding your time for me this evening. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Ms. Joes? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Cruz has, has left. Uh, Mr. McMillian? Yep. When I speak, I try to, I try to pick my words carefully. I, I try not to waste words. Dr. Hager, that was, I love that idea of 12-month school. Uh, I'd be willing to sit on a committee to look at that and start looking at it now. Here are three things I want to say. We need to revisit hybrid Board of Education meetings. I know I talk fast, and I know this is the end of the meeting, but some of this stuff I think is good. Uh, virtual snow days, we need to, to continue to look at that. And number three, what do we do with high school students who love virtual learning and have proven they can be successful in this setting? I personally don't think we force these students back into traditional classrooms. We need to approach the MSBE now to request our high school virtual coursework be evaluated so adjustments can be made to make sure all of our virtual classes are certifiable toward high school graduation requirements. Imagine the implications for our overcrowded high schools. Thank you. Uh, 
Ms. Beck. Well, first of all, I'd like to say, uh, Mr. McMillian, I'd be happy to serve on those committees with you. Um, I want to say I, I appreciate it having had the opportunity to attend last week's GTCAC meeting. Um, I always find the meetings to be very well run, and I always learn something new. Last week, I learned that giftedness presents itself in unique and unexpected ways, depending on the child, and it really opened my mind up to looking at things differently. Next week, I look forward to attending my first virtual PTA meeting with parents and teachers from Westtown Elementary School. And since Thanksgiving is my absolute favorite holiday, um, I hope that everyone watching and listening can spend time with their family, just as I pray that I can spend time with my family. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Thank you. Um, I would just like to um, thank everyone who's hung in there with us, who's still here with us, and um, I'd like to wish everyone a happy holiday, and thank you so much to the staff and everyone um, for everything that you do to support us as a board and also um, the children's BCPS. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? It's very late and I just really don't have comments other than to say that I appreciate everyone's patience and I'm sure that everyone is very frustrated with the COVID-19 numbers going up and I hope that everyone wears their masks, wash their hands, social distance, and that if as a whole community we can get these numbers down, then we can open schools. You're muted, Kathleen. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment. I, I really appreciate the work that went into the plan. And I think that um, while the board did not take a vote on it, I think that the superintendent and his team, based on the health metrics and the logistics, can move forward as they would in administering uh, the school system to, you know, really use that because they did a tremendous amount of work. And I know that um, as parents and teachers look into it, and I encourage everyone to um, come back to board docs and the website and to look at all of these documents with all of this tremendous work, because this is the foundation that is going to allow us, um, when the time is right, when the science says, to bring our students back to that irreplaceable dynamic of students with teachers that love and care for them and are so experienced and dedicated uh, to doing the right thing by them and, and all the other support staff, um, which leads me to uh, also recognize that this is uh, coming up. Um, it's uh, educational support staff um, celebration next week, uh, which coincides with American Education Week. Um, but I just am in so grateful for everyone that contributes to our children. And this too shall pass and we will recover and we will do this all together. Um, one of the most interesting things I uh, saw recently was um, a Facebook Live uh, called Black in Blue, uh, which is a um, group that celebrates diversity in U.S. law enforcement by discussing the lives and experiences of minority law enforcement professionals. And our own uh, school resource officer, Don Bridges, was uh, featured in that and uh, just really great discussions about that program. So that concludes board member comments. And our next item on the agenda is information. And I do want to point out that uh, there is the revised superintendent's rule 3111, which is non-instructional services, budget planning and preparation. That's kind of ironic. And um, also new this week is Board of Education follow-up from the October 27th meeting. And I would encourage our stakeholders to go and look at that because it has answers to questions um, that were discussed in the meeting last week. Um, so that's gonna be a new item. We appreciate Dr. Williams doing that. The next item is S, 
agenda setting. And for that, uh, we are considering agenda items for future board meetings and board members will get to, um, we'll go around the dais again, but we'll start with Lily Rowe um, and just mentioning items uh, for consideration for future agendas. I have nothing at this time, thank you. Ms. Scott? Oh, I do not have anything to add at this time, thank you. Ms. Mack? Nothing, thank you. Mr. McMillian? An update on uh, hybrid Board of Education meetings, thank you. Yes, please. Um, Ms. Joes has left. Ms. Hen? Nothing at this time, thank you. And Mr. Offerman is gone, Mr. Mahomes. So, Ms. Pestor? Um, nothing, but I do want to thank Ms. Rowe for um, engaging the rest of the board with the um, audit committee, as a couple of us had requested. You're muted, Kathleen. You're up. Okay, I'll make this quick. Uh, the science of reading. And then I think we do need to discuss um, um, board projects for the audit um, and the Office of Internal Audit. There's a set aside of specific hours in the plan. So I think board members need to start thinking about what they would like to see. Thank you. And good night. And Dr. Higger. I have nothing to add either. So I have a short item and it's uh, from Mr. McMillian. I would um, like the superintendent and team to bring a recommendation to the board uh, around utilizing uh, virtual learning uh, in place of inclement weather days where where appropriate. So that finishes item S, agenda setting. And I did just want to say too that the board officers and Dr. Williams have uh, been having conversations around that. And what board members will be seeing is a 12 month version of the agenda with the items that have certain time defined uh, requirements on them. And then how we are evaluating and filling in um, board member requests, or if it's uh, deemed more appropriate, it might go to a committee or if it's more of a report issue, it may be in the weekly update or as a item of information attached to board docs so that it's openly available. So uh, all of that information is going to be updated and presented to um, the board on a regular basis in our efforts for continuous improvement. And next is announcement, announcements. And finally, so our next board meeting is Tuesday, November 24th, 2020, 6.30 p.m. Everybody take care, stay safe, be well, do your part, and we can all uh, get through this together. Thank you and good night.